section twenty four of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty four the guru no longer travelled with the imperial army but proceeded to kanetch in the eastern part of what is now the ludhiana district there one fata came to pay him his respects and ask if he could do him any service the guru asked for his best mare to aid him in his escape fata who had not been sincere in his protestations of friendship put him off with excuses it is said that when he left the guru and went home he found the mare had died of snake-bite this was understood to be the result of his hypocrisy and churlishness to the guru the guru thence proceeded to hehar also in the ludhiana district where lived kripal the udasi mahant who had so distinguished himself in the battle of bangani the guru on meeting him dismissed ghani khan and nabi khan after giving them presents and a letter recommending them to the consideration of the faithful though kripal had been previously so devoted to the guru he now feared to entertain him lest the mohammedans should be informed that he was sheltering an outlaw he accordingly advised the guru to move on towards the villages of lama and jatpura on the way thither the guru met a mohammedan called kala a rich and important person who was chaudhri of chagrayan and raikot two considerable towns of the ludhiana district kalha entertained him at jatpura the guru requested him to send a messenger to sarhind to inquire the fate of his mother and his two youngest sons the guru remained at jatpura until the messenger's return jatpur is about fifty miles distant from sarhind this distance the messenger is said to have traversed in an incredibly short space of time the following is the messenger's story one of the most painful in history it has been already stated that the guru's mother entrusted herself and the two grandsons who accompanied her to a brahman he with sweet words took them to his house and induced them to put faith in him when the guru's mother went to sleep he stole her money which she carried in a saddle-bag and buried it he then went to her and told her there were several thieves prowling about the neighbourhood and she must be careful of her valuables he said he gave her this information so that she might not afterwards blame him she called her servant and told him what she had heard he almost immediately afterwards informed her that her saddle-bag was missing as no one had entered the house but the ladies party and the brahman she interrogated the latter on the subject he pretended to be furious at suspicion having been directed against him and said that that was the result of doing good and of entertaining homeless wayfarers and outlaws he had saved the guru's mother and children from death and the return they made him for his trouble and hospitality was to charge him with theft as if he were a vulgar malefactor then saying that he could not trust her and her children he ordered them to leave his house the brahman with loud cries proceeded to the chaudhri or chief civil official of kheri and informed him that the guru's mother and sons had just come to his house and both he and the chaudhri would obtain a large reward for delivering them to the imperial authorities the brahman and the chaudhri then went to the next highest official arangar the governor of marinda he proceeded with them to the brahman's house and thence they took the guru's mother and her two grandsons to wazir khan viceroy of sarhind he ordered them to be confined in a tower people thronged next day to see them and cursed and abused the treacherous brahman to their heart's content wazir khan ordered the children to be brought before him when the guru's mother heard the order it stung her like a sharp arrow 
one sokanan khatri who had vainly sued for one of the guru's sons as a husband for his daughter now came forward and said the children were certainly the progeny of the serpent that is sons of the guru and that when they grew up they would be as destructive as their father the governor of Marinda told mata gujari in order to pacify her that he would send the children back after showing them to wazir khan not believing him she put one of them at each side of her and tried to conceal them with her dress the guru's son jajjar singh on hearing the rangar's voice stood up and said to his grandmother the turks have ever been our enemies how can we escape from them therefore let us go to the viceroy saying this he took his younger brother fatah singh and went with the rangar when they reached the viceroy's court the rangar in order to add to their sufferings told them that their father their two eldest brothers and their companions had all been killed in chamkaur he added your only hope of escape now is to bow before the viceroy and accept islam and perhaps he will spare your lives jajjar singh when confronted with the viceroy thus addressed him my father the holy guru gobind singh is not dead who can kill him he is protected by the immortal god if any one say that he can tear down heaven how is that possible were a storm to attempt to drive a mountain before it could it ever do so were any one to try to grasp the sun and moon it would be a feat impossible to accomplish were the guru to desire it he could destroy every trace of you but he deemeth it his first duty to obey the laws of heaven when we have dedicated our heads to our father who is such a guru why should we bow them before a false and deceitful sinner on hearing this the people all cried out that the children ought to be allowed to go unharmed the misnamed sukhanand now interposed and repeated that these were the offspring of a cobra and from their heads to their feet filled with venom see my friends he said they have not the least fear and are so proud that they even insult and defy the viceroy wazir khan then reflected that if the children became mohammedans it would be a gain and glory to his faith he told them that if they would accept his faith he would grant them an estate marry them to the daughters of chiefs and they would become happy and be honoured by the emperor jujar singh then looking at his younger brother said my brother the time to sacrifice our lives as our grandfather guru teg bahadur did hath now arrived what thinkest thou fatah singh replied brother dear our grandfather parted with his head but not with his religion and he ordered us to follow his example now that we have received the baptism of the spirit and the sword what care we for death wherefore it is best that we should give our lives and thus save the sikh religion and bring down god's vengeance on the turks jujar singh again spoke on the same subject my brother our grandfather guru teg bahadur spurned the mohammedan religion here is this noble family of ours a man like guru gobind singh our father a man like guru teg bahadur our grandfather a man like guru har gobind our great-grandfather we who are their descendants cannot attach a stigma to their memories the young boy waxing still more angry continued here o viceroy i spurn thy religion and will not part with mine own it hath become the custom of our family to forfeit life rather than faith o fool why seekest thou to tempt us with worldly ambition we will never be led astray by the false advantages thou offerest the indignities inflicted by the turks on our grandfather shall be the fire to consume them and our deaths the wind to fan the flame in this way we shall destroy the turks without forfeiting our holy faith the mohammedan viceroy could not endure outspokenness of this description and in the words of the chronicler began to burn like sand in a fiery furnace he said he must put the children to death they had no fear of any one and their words were liable to cause disaffection and religious apathy in others sukhanand was ready to support the viceroy and suggested additional reasons for putting the children to death 
he said they had spoken insolently before the viceroy and when they grew up they would follow their father's example and destroy armies what good could be expected from them they would be always exciting revolts they were prisoners with no right of pardon and if they were released no one knew what they would do there were no means for their repression but death then out spoke the nawab of malar katla o oh, viceroy these children are still drinking milk in the nursery and are too young to commit an offence they know not good from evil wherefore be pleased to allow them to depart this representation the viceroy heeded not but cast about for some one to kill the children his servants who were present said they were willing to sacrifice their lives for him but they were not executioners he turned to right and left but all his staff hung down their heads in token of refusal and pity for the children at last looking behind him he espied a gilzai who with the cruelty of his race offered to do the sanguinary deed it is a general belief among the sikhs that the children were bricked into a wall and suffered to die in that position but the authors of the suraj parkash and of the gur bilas both state that the children were put to death in the order of their ages by the sword of the gilzai executioner they vied with each other as to who should first have the honour of martyrdom the two children jujar singh and fatah singh aged nine and seven years respectively perished on the thirteenth of po sambat seventeen sixty two a d seventeen hundred and five a rich sikh called todar mal as soon as he heard of the imprisonment of the guru's children hastened to the viceroy with the intention of ransoming them but arrived too late the children had already been put to death he then proceeded to the guru's mother mata gujari who had not yet heard of the execution of her grandchildren but was at the same time suffering extreme mental agony she every now and then would pray to the gurus to protect her little ones o guru nanak may no hair of my grandchildren's heads be touched o my son guru gobind singh pardon my sins and protect me now woe is me i know not what may happen to my grandchildren to-day todar mal sought to break the sad intelligence to her but his voice was stifled in his throat on seeing this mata gujari became extremely alarmed and standing up at once said tell me the truth why art thou sorrowful when will they allow my grandsons to return and what questions have they put them todar mal then strengthening his resolve addressed her i have made my heart harder than a stone and come to tell thee of the death of thy grandchildren o mother the light of thine eyes the support of the world the life of the sikhs the darlings of the guru have been to-day massacred by the turks on receiving this news mata gujari was struck down as if a mountain had fallen on her todar mal began to fan her in her swoon with the skirt of his dress on recovering consciousness to some extent she began to call upon her grandsons o jujar singh o fatah singh after such love for me whither have you gone take me with you who will call now me mother or grandmother who will come and sit on my lap how shall i now behold you o youthful warriors light of my courtyard son of my family i know not what your sufferings must have been to-day o my grandchildren on whom i have never turned my back even when asleep to-day alas alas the mohammedan tyrants have killed you the darlings of mine eyes my beautiful ones i concealed my grandsons from the gaze of others and behold what hath happened to-day what have i done to you o children that you should have abandoned me to misery saying this she fell heavily to the ground and gave up her spirit todar mal cremated the bodies of the guru's mother and her grandchildren and buried their ashes a sikh temple now called fatah gar was subsequently erected on the spot when the turks heard that the brahman who had betrayed the guru's mother and children possessed much wealth they arrested him and all his family and forced him by torture to tell where he had concealed his treasure he pointed out the spot where he had buried mata gujari's money but it was not found there 
the turks believing that he was only deceiving them continued to torture him until his soul took flight to the infernal regions while the guru was listening to the narrative he was digging up a shrub with his knife he said as i dig up this shrub by the roots so shall the turks be extirpated he inquired if any one except the nawab of malar Kotla had spoken on behalf of the children the messenger replied in the negative the guru then said that after the roots of the oppressive turks were all dug up the roots of the nawab should still remain his sikhs should one day come and lay sarhind waste before the guru had set out from jatpur he presented his host kala with a sword to preserve in memory of him he was to honour it with incense and flowers as long as he did so he and his family should flourish but if ever he wore it he should lose his possessions kala during his lifetime treated the sword according to the guru's injunctions and so did his son after him but his grandson put on the weapon and employed it in the chase in endeavouring to kill a deer with it he struck his own thigh and died of the wound the author of the surab parkash wrote that this incident actually occurred when he was a boy and he still remembered it End of chapter twenty four section twenty five of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty five the guru continued his retreat from the turks and proceeded on his litter from jatpura to dina on the way he met a sikh who presented him with a horse and saddle on arriving at dina the guru met shamira lakmira and takmal grandsons of jad rai who had rendered material assistance to guru har gobind in the battle of gurusar jad rai's family at first lived at kangar his grandsons had now left that village and gone to dina the guru represented to the young men that they incurred danger in entertaining him but they felt no apprehension and gave him hospitable treatment while there the guru gathered some fighting men to his standard during the guru's stay at dina he was visited by parm singh and dharm singh descendants of bhai rupa of whom mention has been made in the life of the sixth guru parm singh and dharm singh made the guru an offering of a horse and a dress the guru took special notice of shamira and gave him the horse and the dress which parm singh and dharm singh had presented him the guru told shamira that he should own land as far as he could course his steed shamira mentioned this in his household his maternal uncle laughed at the guru's promise and said that if the guru had been able to work miracles he would not now be a fugitive shamira was partially convinced by this argument and merely coursed his steed round his own village as the result of his want of faith he only remained in possession of the land within the circle he thus described the viceroy of sarhind heard that the guru was being entertained by shamira and his brothers in dina he wrote to shamira on the subject and ordered him under pain of his highest displeasure to arrest and surrender the guru shamira replied that he was only entertaining his priest as the viceroy himself or any one else might do the guru was merely visiting his sikhs and molesting no one while sending this reply shamira feared that the viceroy would send troops and arrest the guru so he sent a spy to obtain information of the viceroy's movements and proceedings the viceroy kept troops ready but did not send them immediately meanwhile the guru enlisted several men and prepared for his defence the guru's stay at dina appears to have been somewhat protracted for it was there he wrote his celebrated zafar nama or persian epistle to aurangzeb it begins as usual in such compositions with an invocation to god 
o thou perfect in miracles eternal beneficent bestower of grace maintenance salvation and mercy dispenser of bliss pardoner saviour remitter of sins dear to the heart king of kings bestower of excellence indicator of the way without colour and without equal lord who giveth heavenly bliss to him who hath no property no retinue no army and no comforts distinct from the world powerful whose light is everywhere diffused thou bestowest gifts as if thou wert present in person pure cherisher bestower of favours thou art merciful and provider of sustenance in every land thou art lord of every clime the greatest of the great perfect in beauty merciful master of knowledge support of the unhappy protector of the faith fountain of eloquence searcher of hearts author of revelation appreciator of wisdom lord of intelligence diviner of secrets omnipresent god thou knowest the affairs of the world thou resolvest its difficulties thou art its great organizer address to aurangzeb i have no faith in thine oath to which thou tookest the one god as witness i have not a particle of confidence in thee thy treasurer and thy ministers are all false he who putteth faith in thine oath on the koran is thereby a ruined man the insolent crow cannot touch him who hath fallen under the shadow of the puma he who taketh the protection of a powerful tiger cannot be approached by a goat a buffalo or a deer had i even secretly sworn on the volume of my choice faith to accept thy religion i should not have had to withdraw my infantry and cavalry from anandpur as to my defeat at chamkaur what could forty men do when a hundred thousand came on them unawares the oath-breakers attacked them abruptly with swords arrows and muskets i was constrained to engage in the combat and i fought to the utmost of my ability when an affair passeth beyond the region of diplomacy it is lawful to have recourse to the sword had i been able to repose confidence in thine oath on the koran i would not have abandoned my city had i not known that thou wert crafty and deceitful as a fox i would never on any account have come hither he who cometh to me and sweareth on the koran ought not to kill or imprison me thine army came clothed like blue bottles and all of a sudden charged with a loud shout every soldier of thine who advanced beyond his defences to attack my position fell deluged in blood thy troops who had committed no aggression received no injury at our hands when i saw that nahar khan entered the fight i quickly gave him the taste of my arrow many soldiers who came with him and boasted of their prowess ignominiously deserted the field of battle another afghan officer advanced like a rushing flood an arrow or a musket ball he made many assaults received many wounds and at last while in the act of killing two of my sikhs was killed himself Quaja mardud remained behind a wall and came not forth like a man had i but seen his face i would certainly have bestowed an error on him too at last many were killed on both sides by showers of arrows and bullets and the earth became red as a rose heads and legs lay in heaps as if the field were covered with balls and hockey sticks the whizzing of arrows the twanging of bows and a universal hubbub reached the sky men the bravest of the brave fought like madmen but how could forty even of the bravest succeed when opposed by a countless host when the lamp of day was veiled the queen of night came forth in all her splendour and god who protected me showed me the way to escape from mine enemies there was not a hair of my head touched nor did i in any way suffer did i not know that thou o faithless man wert a worshipper of wealth and perjurer thou keepest no faith and observest no religion thou knowest not god and believest not in mohammed he who hath regard for his religion never swerveth from his promise thou hast no idea of what an oath on the koran is and canst have no belief in divine providence wert thou to take a hundred oaths on the koran i would not even then trust thee in the slightest hadst thou any intention of keeping thine oath thou wouldst have girded up thy loins and come to me 
when thou didst swear by muhammad and call the word of god to witness it was incumbent on thee to observe that oath were the prophet himself present here i would make it my special object to inform him of thy treachery do what is incumbent on thee and adhere to thy written promise thou shouldst have cheerfully fulfilled it and also the verbal promises of thine envoy everybody ought to be a man of his word and not utter one thing while he meditateth another thou didst promise to abide by the words of thy kazi if thou hast spoken truly then come to me if thou desire to seal thy promise on the koran i would gladly send it to thee for the purpose if thou come to the village of kangar we shall have an interview thou shalt not run the slightest danger on the way for the whole tribe of barars are under me come to me that we may speak to each other and that i may utter kind words to thee i am a slave and servant of the king of kings and ready to obey his order with my life should his order reach me i will go to thee with all my heart if thou have any belief in god delay not in this matter it is thy duty to know god he never ordered thee to annoy others thou art seated on an emperor's throne yet how strange are thy justice thine attributes and thy regard for religion alas a hundred times alas for thy sovereignty strange strange is thy decree promises not meant to be fulfilled injure those who make them smite not any one mercilessly with the sword or a sword from on high shall smite thyself o oh man be not reckless fear god he cannot be flattered or praised the king of kings is without fear he is the true emperor of earth and heaven god is the master of both worlds he is the creator of all animals from the feeble ant to the powerful elephant he is the protector of the miserable and destroyer of the reckless his name is the support of the unhappy it is he who showeth man the way he ought to go thou art bound by thine oath on the koran bring the matter to a good issue according to thy promises it is incumbent on thee to act wisely and be discreet in all thine actions what though my four sons were killed i remain behind like a coiled snake what bravery is it to quench a few sparks of life thou art merely exciting a raging fire the more how well spoke the sweet-tongued fir dowsi haste is the devil's work i would have gone many times to thee had thy promise been kept when the bullocks were plundered as thou didst forget thy word on that day so will god forget thee god will grant thee the fruit of the evil deed thou didst design it is good to act according to thy religion and to know that god is dearer than life i do not deem thou knowest god since thou hast done acts of oppression wherefore the great god knoweth thee not and will not receive thee with all thy wealth hadst thou sworn a hundred times on the koran i would not have trusted thee in the slightest even for a moment i will not enter thy presence nor travel on the same road with thee but if god so will it i will proceed towards thee fortunate art thou aurangzeb king of kings expert swordsman and writer handsome is thy person and intelligent art thou emperor and ruler of the country thou art clever to administer thy kingdom and skilled to wield the sword thou art generous to thy co-religionists and prompt to crush thine enemies thou art the great dispenser of kingdoms and wealth thy generosity is profuse and in battle thou art firm as a mountain exalted is thy position thy loftiness is as that of the pleiades thou art king of kings and ornament of the thrones of the world thou art monarch of the world but far from thee is religion i wanted to kill the hillmen who were full of strife they worshipped idols and i was an idol breaker behold the power of the good and pure god who by means of one man killed hundreds of thousands what can an enemy do when god the friend is kind his function it is as the great bestower to bestow he giveth deliverance and pointeth out the way to his creatures he teacheth the tongue to utter his praises in the hour of action he blindeth the enemy he rescueth the helpless and protecteth them from injury the merciful showeth mercy to him who acteth honestly god bestoweth peace on him who heartily performeth his service how can an enemy lead astray him with whom the guide of the way is well pleased should tens of thousands proceed against such a person the creator will be his guardian 
when thou lookest to thine army and wealth i look to god's praises thou art proud of thine empire while i am proud of the kingdom of the immortal god be not heedless this caravansary is only for a few days people leave it at all times behold the revolution which passeth over every denizen and house in this faithless world even though thou art strong annoy not the weak lay not the axe to thy kingdom when god is a friend what can an enemy do even though he multiply himself a hundred times if an enemy practise enmity a thousand times he cannot as long as god is a friend injure even a hair of one's head the guru sent the above to the emperor by daya singh and dharm singh who had survived the battle of chamkaur and escaped to dina with the guru they disguised themselves as mohammedan pilgrims and proceeded on their journey to the south of india on reaching dili they took shelter in the sikh temple and received the visits of several admiring sikhs next morning they set out for agra thence they crossed the river chambal and proceeded to ajain whence they crossed the narbada and travelled by burhampur to aurangabad thence they proceeded to ahmad nagar where the emperor was encamped there daya singh and dharm singh met a sikh called jetha singh who told them it would be very difficult for them to obtain an audience of the emperor they said it did not matter and asked him to summon all the sikhs who were there to meet them and hear their story daya singh and dharm singh told the sikhs of their mission and read a letter specially addressed to them by the guru End of chapter 25section twenty six of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty six meanwhile the guru was preparing for his defence at dina but in order that the innocent villagers might not suffer from warlike operations directed against him he pitched his tent in the neighbouring forest it would appear that he approached if he did not actually enter the present village of jalal for it is recorded that the inhabitants of that village gave him supplies and a lance for defence they complained that the inhabitants of a neighbouring village bore them enmity there were always affrays between the two villages and the inhabitants of jalal were always worsted the guru told them to obey and believe in him and they should always be victorious they trusted him and obtained several victories subsequently however the inhabitants of jalal forgot their promises to the guru and stole horses belonging to the sikhs the offenders were punished and expelled from their village by those whom they had wronged they subsequently begged the sikhs pardon and were allowed to dwell at gurusar where the guru had encamped the guru thence proceeded to the village of bhagta in the present state of faridkot the village had been called after bhai bhagtu a grandson of bhai bahilo who was a distinguished sikh in the time of guru arjan bhagtu had five sons gurdas tara bara mihra and bhakta they presented a fully caparisoned steed to the guru gurdas and tara are the men we have already described as masands of ram rai by this time they had returned to their native village the guru remained in bhakta for three days and on the fourth travelled to wandar in the present district of firozpur thence he proceeded into a dense forest where he met a nephew of kapura the chaudhry of several villages round kot kapura in the present state of faridkot the nephew complained that his uncle had expelled him he was he said marching to do battle with him but on hearing of the guru's arrival he first went to pay him his respects that being a more holy object than making war on his uncle the guru said that kapura's troops would arrive on the morrow but his nephew must not at present engage in a combat with them his troops would subsequently conquer those of kapura the nephew following the guru's advice decided to remain at home on the morrow 
his wife however on seeing him thus ingloriously inactive asked for his sword and turban offered him her petticoat and said she would go and fight herself this taunt roused her husband to action in disregard of the guru's advice he went to the battle and was killed by his uncle's forces the guru thence proceeded to bahiwal and sarawan and billeted his sikhs on the villages one sikh named maliargar singh was fed by a poor villager on pilan the tiny fruit of the jal tree he told the guru that he had had an excellent dinner the guru on subsequently discovering that he had dined on pilan and thus received only indifferent food complimented him on his contentment and said that sikhs ought ever to act as he had done and never dispraise food offered them the guru continued if any one come to a sikh and receive not food from him know that that sikh hath sinned if any one beg food from a sikh he too hath sinned because of his greed the guru then visited kot kapur and put up outside the city under a pipal tree which is still pointed out to the traveller it is in a little promontory in the centre of a lake formed by the excavation of earth to build the town kapur came to see him and brought him a fully caparisoned horse and other presents next day kapur again visited him and found him seated on one couch while his weapons were laid before him on another he reverenced arms because he said they who wore them and practised their use became brave and conquered their enemies the guru begged kapura's permission to take shelter in his fort kapura replied that he had no power to withstand the imperial army and no desire to wander a fugitive like the guru the guru then said the muhammadans would take his fort put his head into a bag of ashes and then hang him kapura left in anger and going home closed the gates of the fort so that the guru might not enter by surprise the guru heard that wazir khan's army was now in hot pursuit he accordingly set out from kapura and sought shelter in dilwan a village about four miles to the southeast of it there prithi chand's descendants had been settled for some time one of them called kal now a very old man visited the guru and made him a present of a suit of clothes upon this the guru threw off and burned the greater part of the blue dress which he had been using for disguise in the asa ki war occurs the line neil bastar le capre pahire turk pathani amal kirya the turks and pathans put on blue clothes and reigned for this the guru read neil bastar le capre fare turk pathani amal gaya i have torn the blue clothes which i wore the rule of the turks and pathans is at an end the guru meant the alteration as a curse on the turks and pathans it was deemed an impious act to alter any part of the granth sahib this the guru did not deny but said he hoped that the murder of his father and of his own children and the grievous sufferings of his sikhs were a sufficient atonement a piece of his blue clothes which the guru did not consign to the fire he preserved in memory of his troubles it is said to have subsequently suggested the blue dress of the akalis or nihangs the guru soon left dilwan and pitched his tent in a forest between maluka and kotha thence he proceeded to jaito in the present state of naba there kapura arrived on a hunting excursion he complained of perturbation of mind on account of the curse the guru had uttered the guru however refused to retract his words on the contrary he said that kapura should ever remain a puppy of the muhammadans and have great suffering in consequence while the guru was in this locality a messenger arrived with the news that wazir khan's army was marching hither and would arrive in a few days the guru asked kapura for a guide kapura sent an officer called khana and some troopers with instructions to show him the way as far as kidrana but not engage in any combat and if possible hinder the guru from doing so next morning the guru escaped to ramiana in the varikot state on the way he found a man gathering the fruit of the wild caper 
the guru tasted but not relishing it told the man to throw it away the man would not do so altogether the guru said it had been his intention to banish drought from that part of the country but now he could not do so owing to the man's obstinacy and disregard of his orders from ramiana the guru proceeded towards kidrana all the contests and sufferings of the guru became known in the manja and the sikhs who dwelt there censured themselves for having listened to duni chand and abandoned the guru at anandpur they now began to consider how they could make reparation and assist their spiritual master in his dire extremity they were however of the opinion of the sikhs of lahore that the guru should adopt the way of baba nanak and cease all hostilities they sent a large deputation to press their advice on him and promised that if he accepted it they would use influence with the emperor to pardon him otherwise they would not consider themselves his sikhs or him their guru the guru on the way to kidrana arrived at a village owned by a khatri called rupa who warned him off through fear of the emperor's displeasure the guru had a barar named dan singh as his clerk and chamberlain dan singh's son saw the enemy approaching and duly informed the guru the guru took no notice but continued to walk his horse the warning was repeated but the guru heeded it not the youth then struck the guru's horse with the object of quickening his pace at this the guru became angry and uttered words of censure don singh interceded for his son the guru replied that he treated don singh's son as his own and a father's censure would not affect his children the guru instanced the case of a tigress removing her cubs from a burning forest when she takes them in her mouth every one thinks she is going to devour them but this is not so her act is prompted by love the deputation of the manja sikhs found the guru after much search on hearing their representation he said if you were my sikhs you would receive and not give me instruction i do not require you you deserted me formerly who hath sent for you now you have come to adjust my quarrels but where were you when i needed your assistance you used no influence with the emperor when guru arjan was tortured to death or when guru teg bahadur was beheaded on this account my brethren i cannot listen to your advice when i am again in difficulty you will betray me as before put on record that you renounce me and go to your homes upon this the deputation drew up a formal document to the effect that they renounced the guru unless he ceased to contend with the turks a sikh who had been put on a tree to keep watch said i see the enemy approaching and they will soon see us the guru took up his bow and arrows and mounted his horse he was advised by kapoor's guide to go to kidrana where there was water of which he could hold possession and where the muhammadans if they ventured thither would die of thirst the guru said there is dust in the eyes of the muhammadans and earth in their mouths they may stare as much as they please but when i remember the holy baba nanak they cannot see me five of the manja sikhs repented of their renunciation of the guru and decided to return and render him all assistance they induced thirty-five more of their number to return with them the guru thus obtained an unexpected reinforcement of forty good and earnest fighting men they were joined by a heroine named bago who through zeal for the sikh cause had donned man's attire and vowed to suffer death if necessary on the blood-stained field of danger on behalf of the guru the guru and his personal guard preceded them to kidrana in the present firazpur district of the punjab but on finding no water there the tank having run dry moved on into the neighbouring forest where they deemed they should be in greater safety and whence they could more easily escape if overpowered the forty men of the manja on arriving at kidrana decided to cover the trees in the neighbourhood with clothes so that the enemy might think they were encamped in great numbers and not make a sudden attack on them kapoor appeared in the enemy's ranks he overtly came to show them the way by which he had instructed his officer to take the guru and his forty sikhs to their destruction 
wazir khan ordered his army to charge the sikhs who stood to oppose him and in whose ranks he believed the guru to be concealed they received the charge with the utmost bravery the muhammadans were giving way when wazir khan rallied them by asking if they were not ashamed to fly before such a handful of men five sikhs who advanced to the front were riddled with bullets ten more advanced to the imperial army and cleared the field wherever they went when they were cut down the enemy took courage and advanced nearer the remaining sikhs eleven sikhs then rushed on the enemy and smote them down they were however unable to cope with superior numbers and fell under the swords of the muhammadans the woman bago fought heroically in their ranks disposed of several of her muhammadan opponents and transmitted her name as an indian heroine for the admiration of future generations the guru and his bodyguard had taken up their position on a sand hill about two miles distant he discharged arrows from their with fatal effect against the muhammadans who could not see from what quarter destruction was raining on them at the conclusion of the engagement wazir khan thought the guru was killed and ordered his men to search for his body the tank at kidrana as already stated having become dry wazir khan's army was in great straits for want of water kapoor told him that it could only be obtained at a distance of thirty miles in front and ten miles in rear and advised him to march back and save the lives of his men and horses otherwise they would all perish to such distress was the muhammadan army reduced that they abandoned their dead and wounded and relinquished their search for the body of the guru wazir khan boasted that he had killed him and that the emperor on hearing the joyful intelligence would greatly honour and reward him on finding that the muhammadan army had departed the guru went to see the battlefield relieved the wounded and performed the obsequies of the slain he went about wiping the faces of both dead and wounded and extolling their unsurpassed valour copious tears flowed from his eyes he said the dead had given up their lives for him and they should abide in bliss in the guru's paradise he found mahan singh breathing heavily and desiring a last sight of his spiritual master the guru told him to open his eyes and when he did so his strength returned the guru invited him to ask for any boon he desired from empire to salvation mahan singh thought it was best to ask for the cancellation of the deed of renunciation of the guru drawn up by the manja sikhs the guru at first refused but on being pressed consented to cancel it he drew the document from his pocket and destroyed it mahan singh then breathed his last the guru ordered the bararars he had recently enlisted to collect the slain and cremate them he promised that all sikhs who visited the place on the first of magh the anniversary of the battle should become filled with the martial spirit of their sires kidrana has since that time been called muktsar or the tank of salvation because those who fell on that spot were no more subject to transmigration in the process of collecting the slain it was found that another person showed signs of life this was the heroine bhaga the guru addressed her taking off thy woman's dress thou didst come to me with the manja sikhs it is well that thou hast fought here blessings on thy life arise and come with me she detailed the story of her departure from her home in the company of the sikhs of the manja and then continued i obtained possession of a strong spear when all the sikhs were dead the turks advanced on me i spitted several of them others directed their weapons against me but thou didst extend thine arm to save me now that i have seen thee i am happy and have no further desire than to abide with thee End of chapter twenty six section twenty seven of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty seven the guru thence proceeded to saran and thence to nutheha the inhabitants of the latter village prayed him to leave them he then went to tahlian vata saman a village about twenty miles south-west of muktsar where he was welcomed some sikhs from hariki came to him with an offering of a lungi and a kahes the guru put the kahes on his shoulders and tied the lungi 
round his loins man singh remonstrated and reminded him of his own prohibition of the wearing of a lungi in this fashion and said he was liable to a fine the guru replied i am dressed according to the custom of the country jeha des teha behes ter lungi madhe kahes every country hath its own dress a lungi for the loins and a kahes shawl for the shoulders the guru feeling his insecurity asked that a guard should be provided for him the warlike sikhs put some dogars on guard the guru intended to reward the hariki sikhs had they kept guard themselves as it was he blessed the dogars and foretold that they should have possession of all the adjacent river banks the prophecy has been fulfilled and there their descendants have since remained next day the guru continued his journey and rested under a bur tree where he passed the night the following day he proceeded to wajidpur some six or seven miles to the east of firazpur the inhabitants told him that the emperor's drums were often heard there and they suggested to him to depart the guru said that instead of the drums of the emperor the praises of the sikhs should subsequently resound in the locality the place afterwards fell into the possession of the kanhaya misal while in this neighbourhood the guru heard the cry of a partridge and pursued it the partridge gave chase and tired out men and horses at last the guru caught it plucked it and threw it before his hawk which after some hesitation began to devour it the guru when asked the cause of this strange proceeding told the following anecdote in a previous birth the partridge had been an the agriculturist and the hawk a money-lender the agriculturist had borrowed from the money-lender squandered the money and then went to live in another village the money-lender followed him and insisted on payment the, the agriculturist begged for time and promised to discharge the debt the money-lender demanded a surety the agriculturist said he had no surety but the guru the money-lender was then satisfied and went home the agriculturist however ultimately failed to pay the money both died soon after upon which the agriculturist became this partridge and the money-lender my hawk the hawk at first refused to touch the partridge as the latter had given me as surety i have now fulfilled my surety ship by bestowing the partridge on the hawk if any one give me again as surety and discharge not his debt i will treat him as the hawk hath done the partridge the guru left wajidpur and returned to muksar thence he proceeded to rapana and thence to bahundar garusar and tehri after that he proceeded to kaljaharani thence he marched to chahatiana and on his way passed through several minor villages in chahatiana some of his soldiers clamoured for their pay and said they would not allow him to proceed further until he had paid them their arrears he offered them their choice of remaining his sikhs or of taking their pay and returning to their homes they elected to take their pay and dismissal at this juncture a sikh opportunely arrived with a large pecuniary offering for the guru he summoned his soldiers and gave them their pay at the rate of eight annas per day for cavalry and four annas per day for infantry to don singh their officer the guru offered his pay but he refused to take it and elected to share the guru's fortunes the guru complimented him on laying the foundation stone of the sikh religion in malwa as mahan singh had done in the manjaha his troops were meditating how they could extort more money from the guru they told him he had offered them the alternative of taking their pay or becoming sikhs as they had accepted the former they were now excluded from sikhism they asked for double pay partly to compensate them for their religious disability and partly to support their people at home 
the guru complied with their demand and that he might not be pestered with further extortionate demands buried the remainder of the money which his pious follower had brought him a muhammadan fakir called Bra brahmi ibrahim who lived on a neighbouring mound came to the guru with offerings and asked to be baptized the guru expressed his satisfaction at the proposal thou art the first moslem to be baptized according to my rights if any moslem whether of high or low position and good faith desire to join the khalsa it is proper that he should be baptized and received into our community the muhammadan was accordingly baptized and received the name ajmer singh the guru thence went to the village of sahib chand and thence to kat bahai on his way he baptized several people from there he proceeded to rohila and then to bambuha where he remained nine days thence he returned to bajak when the guru was in the neighbourhood of maluka and kotha one of the sect called diwanas madmen who attempted forcible access to him was cut down by his sentry while the guru was in bajak guda and diwanas spiritual guide sought to avenge the death of his follower and accordingly sent fifty men of his sect to assassinate the guru on learning however that the guru had a strong bodyguard forty-eight of them turned back and only two suku and budha proceeded to the guru they carried no weapons but whiled away their time on the journey with the music of a sarangi on reaching the guru instead of trying to kill him they began to play and sing for him they sang among others the following verses the soul resideth in a frail body parents are not for ever nor doth youth abide we must all march onwards why should man be proud the guru was much pleased with them and they were equally pleased with him to show their satisfaction and the pleasure they felt in his company they took up his bed on their shoulders and carried it for more than a mile the guru gave them a square rupee and told them to preserve it in memory of him and promised that they should obtain whatever their hearts desired the guru then proceeded to jassi baghwala and thence towards talwandi sabo now called damdama in the patiala state halting on the way at a place called paka in talwandi sabo resided his friend dalla who asked him why he had not previously applied to him for assistance against the treacherous mohammedans he said he could have saved the guru much suffering here the guru met some sikhs who had come from lahore with a musket as an offering he asked dalla for two men to serve as targets to make trial of the weapon all who heard him thought he was insane and made no reply the guru then saw two rangahreta sikhs and invited them to submit to the trial when the guru called them they were tying on their turbans but so eager were they to please him that they went before him with their turbans only half bound and vied with each other as to who should first be the subject of his experiment the guru said he only wanted one of them and further explained that he merely desired to prove the cowardice and disloyalty of dallas soldiers and show that had they been with him in anandpur they would have deserted him in the hour of danger the guru's wives mata sundari and sahib kaur here joined him in his wanderings they wept copiously on hearing the fate of the young children the guru endeavoured to console them and said ajit singh zara war singh judge har singh and fatah singh have been sacrificed for their religion and obtained eternal life so why should the mothers of such heroes lament lo the whole world is transitory there is first childhood then youth which diminisheth day by day and at last old age when the body perisheth in the presence of god what is old age what childhood and what youth they are all the same equally of short duration the more we love our bodies the more suffering we endure love for the body is meaningless only those who apply it to good works profit by their lives your sons have gone with honour to where bliss ever abideth having performed the work of the immortal god they have now returned to him therefore accept god's will as the best and most advantageous portion instead of your sons i present you with my sikhs as a brave and worthy offspring dayal das a grandson of bahai bahagtu came from bahuk cho to visit the guru 
the guru wished to baptize him but he refused saying he was a sikh of the ancient fashion and wished to remain so ram singh a great grandson of bahai bahagtu came from chak bahai to invite the guru to go and stay with him the guru promised that he would go some day and requested him to hold his house in readiness to receive him the women bahago who remained with the guru after the battle of muktsar in a fit of devotional abstraction tore off her clothes and wandered half naked in the forest the guru restrained her gave her the khat or sikh drawers and allowed her again to wear man's costume she attained a good old age and died in abchalanagar nander revered by the sikhs as a saint while the guru was in talwandi wazir khan sent a peremptory note to dalla to surrender him or he would dispatch an army and put them both to death dalla replied that the guru was his life and he could not part with him if wazir khan sent an army the guru and dalla would go into the recesses of the forest where even if an army penetrated it would perish for want of water in fine dalla manfully and courageously stated that he intended the guru should reside with him for ever one day the guru probably not wishing to compromise his friend dalla said he would like to see the old fort of bahatinda which had been founded by binaipal he first however in pursuance of his promise went to visit ram singh at chak bahai ram singh informed dayal das of the guru's visit and suggested to him to prepare dinner for him in bahuk cho he did so but the guru refused his hospitality and proceeded to bahagtu on his way to bahatinda the guru took up his residence on the top of the fort where now is a small temple dedicated to him at night some balaches sang of sasi and punu sasi had been brought up by a washerman punu was a balak merchant who came to the punjab with merchandise for sale he met sasi fell in love with her and remained with her until his brother came and took him forcibly away by night sasi at daybreak hearing of his abduction followed him and on arriving at a sandy desert was so overcome by the heat that she expired the poet represented that she had entered the earth in quest of punu next day the guru took occasion to expatiate on love he said men may perform devotion and penance for hundreds of thousands of years but it would be all in vain without the love of god the bairars told the guru a legend regarding the founding of bahatinda one day as binaipal was hunting he saw a wolf and a goat struggling the goat was trying to save her young from the wolf on the very spot where the struggle between the two animals took place binaipal caused the fort to be erected bairars told the guru that there was a subterranean passage between bahatinda and bahatna in bakaner the chroniclers do not state who was in possession of the fort when visited by the guru the guru thence proceeded to sama and thence returned to talwandi sabo there his friend dalla again met him dayal das had been following the guru for some time to present him with the sacred food he had prepared for him and thus secure the guru's pardon on arriving at dam dama ram singh who was in the guru's service interceded for dayal das and the guru was pleased to restore him to his friendship wazir khan sent another letter to dalla to arrest the guru or he would plunder his country and put him to death without mercy dalla replied o viceroy i fear thee not however much thou threatenest me with thine army having destroyed it the guru and i will retire into the forest where thou shalt have no power over us and whence thou shalt have to return when thy troops have perished of hunger and thirst i will by no means have the guru arrested to please thee nay i will defend him with my life zabardast khan the viceroy of lahore plundered a party of sikhs who were going to make offerings to the guru wazir khan the viceroy of sarhind plundered another party going on the same errand the guru then repeated his exhortation to his sikhs to wear arms and diligently practise their use in the early days of sikhism it was different at that time the guru's teaching was to remember the true name and not annoy anybody farid said if any one strike thee with his fist strike him not back with such teaching the guru said the sikhs have become faint-hearted and ever suffered defeat 
now that the times had altered and the sikhs were obliged to defend themselves he had established the khalsa and whoever desired to abide in it should not fear the clash of arms but be ever ready for the combat and the defence of his faith at the same time the name was still to remain the chief object of the sikhs adoration End of chapter twenty seven section twenty eight of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty eight while the guru was at dam dama he dictated the whole of the granth sahib to bhai mani singh and added for the first time the hymns and sloks of his father guru teg bahadur with a slok of his own it is said that the guru used to have baptismal water prepared and thrown among the bushes he explained that he did so in order that the malwa sikhs might increase in number and spring from every forest shrub he used also to have pens made and scattered in different directions by this he meant that the inhabitants of the place should become learned and expert penmen the guru while at damdama used in the afternoon to go into the forest and sit under a john tree the place was hence called john Diana. a temple was subsequently erected there at night the guru used to return to damdama it was while in this neighbourhood he baptized dalla and one hundred other sikhs the guru sent for tilak singh and ram singh who had performed the obsequies of his two sons ajit singh and zorawar singh fallen at chamkaur they came to visit him and made him large offerings the guru was well pleased with them and blessed them and their offspring it may be here mentioned that ram singh is the ancestor of the chief of patiala and tilak singh the ancestor of the chiefs of naba and jind one day the guru said to dalla that is a fine field of wheat i see dalla replied that is grass o true guru wheat groweth not here had we wheat the muhammadans would oppress us say that moth and bajra are growing here another day the guru said o dalla i see excellent sugar-cane here dalla made the same reply as before when the guru said he had seen wheat the guru said thou knowest not thine advantage i desire to make thy land as fertile as sarhind the turks whom thou fearest shall soon perish and the soil of malwa in time bear wheat and sugar-cane this prophecy has been fulfilled canals made by the british government have since fertilized that part of the country it was here the guru heard that kapura had been put to death by isa khan of kot isa khan in the firozpur district the cause and manner of his death were as follows call a descendant of prithi chand had established a religious fair at dilwan kapur attended it and became involved in a drunken brawl with some of the pilgrims call sent a great-grandson of his to interpose but the youth was killed another great-grandson whom he dispatched on a similar errand met with the same fate on this abhai ram the father of the youths slain became furious with kapura desired that the guru's curse on him might speedily take effect and his line be extirpated isa khan with all haste employed a party of men to attack kapura whom he suspected to be a friend of the guru the latter tried to defend himself but was worsted and then tried to conceal himself in a haystack isa khan dragged him forth and made him a prisoner when taking him away he thought he would be only an encumbrance so he ordered him to be hanged on the nearest tree kapur himself remembered the guru's curse that his head should be put into a bag of ashes so he requested it should be done before his execution that the words of the guru might be fulfilled and that he might be thus safe from further transmigration on one occasion a question arose as to what the earth rested on the theories of the hindus and other sects were put forward the guru concluded the discussion by saying that the earth was supported by the power of god who alone was true and permanent he on that occasion repeated the sixteenth pari of the japji 
daya singh and dharm singh whom the guru had sent with the zafarnama to the emperor succeeded in delivering it and were furnished with a parwana of safe conduct for their return journey the perusal of the zafarnama is said to have softened the emperor's heart and led him to repent hence his permission to the guru's messengers to return to their own country in peace and safety they however received no verbal or written reply to the guru's letter the guru asked dalla to accompany him to the south of india dalla replied that he considered his humble couch at damdama was equal to the throne of dili and he pressed the guru and his sikhs to remain with him the bairars in the guru's service also endeavoured to dissuade him from his contemplated journey he refused to listen to them and on this several of them left his service the guru was now left with only dalla singh the two great-grandsons of bhai bhagtu namely ram singh and his brother fatah singh param singh and dharm singh descendants of bhai rupa and bhai mani singh the sikh biographer and arranger of the ad granth and the tenth guru's granth their first march was to kawal thence to jowar thence to janda and thence to sarsa param singh and dharm singh had a new bed provided for the guru at every march dalla singh to every one's intense amazement absconded during the march in the dead of night and took with him a sodhi and several bairars the guru dismissed fatah singh on ram singh's representation that his services and assistance were required at home the guru thence proceeded to narhar a town of bakanar about twenty miles southwest of sarsa though the inhabitants were very rich they do not appear to have been forward in providing supplies for the guru and his few remaining followers on the contrary there was great commotion in the town because one of his sikhs had accidentally killed a pigeon when the guru went into the market-place he saw that the inhabitants were very proud of their wealth and he foretold that it should all soon vanish in a d seventeen hundred and fifty six a sikh expedition was directed against charupur chainpura but on finding the water on the march brackish the soldiers made a diversion and plundered nahar thence the guru proceeded to bahaduran there he gave param singh and dharm singh a horse each and also arms for their defence on arriving at sahua sayo the guru noticed that through respect for him they were taking the arms on their heads and walking beside their chargers as being a guru's gifts the guru said that they should obtain whatever they required and that their tongues should be to them as arms on bidding them farewell he presented them with a religious work containing the morning and evening divine services of the sikhs the guru's next march was to madhu singhana he thence proceeded to pushkar a place of pilgrimage sacred to brahma a brahmin called chetan showed the guru the sacred places of ajmer the guru while in that neighbourhood was often severely heckled on the subject of his dress people said it was neither hindu nor mohammedan the guru admitted the fact and said it was the dress of the third distinct sect which he had established thence the guru proceeded to narainpur generally known as dadu dawara where the saint dadu had lived and flourished his shrine had by this time descended to a mahant called jait who quoted two lines of dadu to the guru dadu surrender thy claim to every worldly thing pass thy days without claims how many have departed after trading in this grocer's shop the guru said these lines were applicable to the invention of a religion but ill suited to its preservation rather should the lines be read asserting thy claim in the world plunder the wicked extirpate him who doeth thee evil the mahant quoted two other lines to the guru dadu taking the times as they come be satisfied with this call age if any one throw a clod or a brick at thee lift it on thy head the guru would not admit the line and altered it thus if any one throw a clod or a brick at thee angrily strike him with a stone the guru then explained the principles of his own religion to the mahant this age is very evil the wicked rule in it and cause suffering to saints and holy men tyrants therefore deserve to be punished they will not refrain as long as they are pardoned o mahant they who bear arms 
who remember the true name and sacrifice their lives for their faith shall go straight to paradise therefore i have established the khalsa religion given my followers arms and made them heroes the guru was censured by his staff for lifting his arrow in salutation of dadu's shrine man singh quoted the guru's own written instructions gor marhi mat bul na mane worship not even by mistake mohammedan or hindu cemeteries or places of cremation the guru explained that he saluted the shrine to test his sikhs devotion and their recollection of his instructions the guru however admitted that he had technically rendered himself liable to a fine and cheerfully paid one hundred and twenty-five rupees the guru thence went to lali thence to magharada and thence to kulate here he met daya singh and dharm singh returning from their embassy to aurangzeb it is probable the embassy reached the emperor when he was ill the envoys told the guru that when they left the emperor's court they heard he had been seized with a colic the guru thence proceeded to baghaur here he heard of aurangzeb's death and the accession of his second son tar azim called muhammad azim shah by muhammadan historians the inhabitants of baghaur refused supplies and quarrelled with the guru's escort a camel belonging to the guru trespassed on one of the town gardens the gardeners beat the camel and abused the camel driver upon this the sikhs went in a body and assaulted the gardeners this led to a counter-assault and fighting which lasted two days by this time the sikhs had stormed and plundered the city but the fort remained to be captured by the advice of ratan singh a sikh whom the guru must have met on his travels a cannon was placed on a hill commanding the fort after a brief cannonade the occupants held out a flag of truce peace was proclaimed but on the arrival of the rajah of the place who had been absent when the fighting began hostilities were resumed dharm singh killed the rajah's commander-in-chief and the guru killed the rajah himself the bag our army then fled and was pursued by the sikhs until the guru recalled them upon this the guru resumed his march on setting out he told the sikhs that the turks should soon fight against one another and that the usurper tara azim should be killed End of chapter twenty eight section twenty nine of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty nine when aurangzeb died his eldest son bahadur shah was engaged in a military expedition in afghanistan when his younger brother tara azim usurped the throne bahadur shah hastened back to india to claim and do battle for his heritage he consulted nand lal a friend of his as to how he should be successful nand lal advised him to seek the guru's assistance the guru on being appealed to promised him not only assistance but sovereignty if he agreed to a request he was about to make and did not prove false like his father bahadur shah was pleased to accept these vague conditions and informed the guru accordingly the guru sent dharm singh with some trusty sikhs to render him all possible assistance and feeling anxiety regarding the grave political circumstances of the country deemed it advisable to retrace his steps to the north in hope of meeting and conferring with the emperor when bahadur shah had fully equipped his army he marched to agra tara azim who was at the time in distant ahmad nagar on hearing of his brother's operations marched by gualiar to contend with him for empire bahadur shah advanced to meet him and encamped at jaju near dalpur dolpur where the opposing armies met after a fight of three days duration not only tara azim but several of his principal officers were slain upon this his army fled and victory remained with bahadur shah he now undisputed monarch of india returned to agra and dispatched dharm singh to inform the guru of his victory on the guru's arrival in dihli he encamped on the left bank of the jamna 
his sikhs thought it unsafe for him to enter that strong mohammedan and imperial centre he erected a temple on the spot where his father guru teg bahadur had been cremated on hearing of bahadur shah's victory the guru resolved to go to agra to congratulate him and made arrangements to leave his wives in dili under the protection of his sikhs upon hearing this mata sundari wept copiously the guru consoled her with the arguments and reflections he had previously employed at damdama on the transitoriness of human life and the bliss in which her son abode as a mighty hero and religious martyr a goldsmith residing in dili came to the guru to pray him to grant him the favour of a son one day as the guru went to the chase accompanied among others by the goldsmith they saw a woman abandon her male infant in the forest the guru told the goldsmith to take and rear the child the goldsmith said he could not afford a wet nurse the guru directed him to take some water recite wa guru over it and wash his wife's breast therewith when she took the child in her lap milk would at once come in abundance the goldsmith accepted the guru's advice and the promised result was obtained when the child was five years of age he was seen by mata sundari who found in him a marvellous likeness to her martyred son and duly adopted him sahib kaur importuned the guru to allow her to accompany him at last he yielded to her entreaties bahadur shah sent a messenger to the guru to expedite his departure the messenger informed him that the emperor feared the bigotry of his co-religionists were he himself to pay the first visit the guru on the third day after his departure from dili arrived at matura and encamped at saraj kund on the banks of the jamna he made a tour through bindraban and visited all its famous and interesting places on his journey to agra the guru wanted water one of his sikhs fetched it from the house of a barren woman of the priestly class and told the guru that there being no children there the water must be pure the guru would not admit that children defiled water and asked it to be brought him from some house where there were sons and daughters on that occasion he said a hermit is best when alone pure is his body and pure his mind but where there is a householder with a large family the house is still purer and so are his body mind and understanding the guru duly met the emperor bahadur shah in agra the emperor thanked him for such assistance as he had given him in obtaining the throne made him costly presents and invited him to spend some time with him the guru was pleased to accept the invitation one day as the guru and a high officer were seated together a sayid of sarhind asked the guru if he could perform a miracle the guru replied that miracles were in the power of the emperor he could raise a humble person to the highest office and dignity or degrade him therefrom the sayid said he knew that but had the guru himself the power of working any miracles upon this the guru drew forth a gold coin and said that it was a miracle for everything could be purchased with it the sayid asked if he could show any further miracles in reply the guru drew his sword and said that that also was a miracle it could cut off heads and confer thrones and empires upon those who wielded it with dexterity upon this the sayid hung down his head and asked no further questions some rajas of rajputana came to visit the guru he told them they did one very regrettable thing namely they gave their daughters in marriage to mohammedan emperors and princes he made them swear that they would for the future desist from the practice one day in conversation with the guru the emperor maintained that if any one were to repeat the mohammedan creed he should not be consigned to hell the guru denied that the creed had that efficacy if any one after repeating it were to do evil the repetition of the creed would not avail him the emperor asked how he was to be assured of that the guru replied the creed is stamped on thy rupee we shall see the effect thereof the guru secretly sent a bad rupee to the market-place to be changed the money changer applied to at once rejected it as counterfeit it was then taken to the other money changers with the same result the guru then addressed the emperor see in thine empire even in thine own market-place no one 
hath paid any regard to thy creed engraved on this rupee so how shall it conduct men to heaven thou to-day enjoyest empire and canst do what thou pleasest if here in thy presence this bad rupee even with the creed on it cannot pass how can it be accepted by another monarch in god's court gilding availeth not the counterfeit and the genuine are there distinguished and men obtain the reward or punishment due to their acts thy creed therefore as in the present case cannot avail thee for admission into heaven without good works when all accounts are called for by the great examiner it is only those who show balances to their credit who shall be delivered the guru and the emperor's conversation turned on the subject of hindu pilgrimages the guru said he himself had no concern with them next day when he visited the emperor the latter said there were two ways the hindu and the mussulman in the world and inquired which the guru preferred to follow the guru said he was well disposed towards both and he instructed every one as he found him the emperor replied there is one god and one faith on what dost thou rely the guru smiled and said my brother there are three gods the emperor inquired where that was written and added a child born yesterday knoweth there is only one god the guru continued why did thine ancestors hinder the hindus from worshipping ram narayan and tell them they must only utter mala pak or kuda thou proclaimest that heaven is made for moslems and hell for the hindus hindus will not associate with any one who adoreth mala pak or kuda such is the quarrel between the two sects know that my religion is that regarding which there is no controversy the hindus have a god whom moslems do not acknowledge and i have a god whom neither of them acknowledge the emperor one day preached the guru a sermon against hindu superstitions the guru agreed with him but at the same time would not flatter the mohammedan religion he said that as the hindu worshipped stones so did the mohammedans worship departed saints and even a black lifeless slab at makkah and as the hindus when at prayer turned their faces to the east the mohammedans turned their faces to the west the mohammedans supposed that their prophet could mediate for them but he had become ashes and what advantage could his ashes or those of his saints confer on men the guru thus found fault with both the hindu and mohammedan religions and said that he had struck out a religion of his own the basis of which was the worship of the sole immortal god some discussion arose on the subject of the guru's discourse but he promptly answered all objections the guru now explicitly stated the request he had several times hinted that he desired to make it was to deliver up to him wazir khan who had killed his children at sarhind the emperor naturally desired to know what the guru proposed to do with him the guru candidly replied that he would have life for life according to the law of retaliation contained in the emperor's sacred book the emperor shuddered on hearing this request but gave no direct refusal he said he would reply after consulting his ministers at the same time he felt that if he surrendered a viceroy to the guru a popular rebellion and a mutiny of his mohammedan army would be the result the emperor therefore requested the guru to wait for a year until his rule was more firmly established and then he would consider the request made the guru on this reproached the emperor with falsehood and said that a sikh should arise who should call the false and counterfeit to account who should seize and kill the emperor's viceroys priests and magistrates and contribute to the ruin of the mughal empire notwithstanding this blunt language and undisguised menace the emperor invited the guru to go with him on a visit to jaipur and other cities the guru promised to join him on the march after a few days he set out and overtook the emperor they both visited jodhpur and jitaur each raja sent his envoy to conciliate and do homage to the guru at chitaur there arose a quarrel between the sikhs and the rajputs on account of some grass the former had taken for their horses the guru censured his sikhs and ordered them to take nothing for the future without payment the emperor and the guru continued their journey to the narbada river the quarrel between the sikhs and the mohammedans was kept alive by the emperor's escort many of whom were relations of the imperial soldiers slain by the sikhs at anandpur the guru sent man singh one of his five beloved to adjust the difference between both parties while on his mission of peace the brave man singh one of the surviving heroes 
of chamkaur who had never parted from the guru was assassinated by a fanatic the emperor was much distressed on hearing of his death and ordered that his murderer should be seized and given up to the guru for punishment the guru pardoned him and thus gained great praise from the muhammadans for his mercy and clemency the emperor and the guru continued their march to burhanpur on the tapti river the inhabitants had prepared a house there for the guru where he passed some time a holy man came to visit him and said o guru i was present with thy father on the bank of the brahmaputra when thou wert born in patna he said that thou shouldst afterwards travel to the south of india the prophecy having now been fulfilled i have come to meet and welcome thee he then gave the guru hospitable entertainment the emperor continued his journey and left the guru at burhanpur after some days the emperor wrote to him to join him and he acceded to his request both then proceeded to Pune and thence to nander on the margin of the river godavari in the present state of hyderabad and about one hundred and fifty miles northwest of its capital end of life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty nine section thirty of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty the original name of nander was now nandera because it is said that nine rikis dwelt there in prehistoric times it is supposed to occupy the site of the ancient city of tagara described by the author of the periplus of the erythrean sea in the middle of the fourth century it was still a place of importance and the capital of a petty kingdom its fortifications have long since been dismantled or have perished by lapse of time and there is now no trace of any ancient building save a few old temple pillars preserved in a small mosque near the court of the sub-collector the country is diversified by dale and hillock along the lazily flowing godavari the guru arrived in nander in sawan july august a d seventeen hundred and seven with some infantry and two or three hundred cavalry equipped with lances he went to the hut of madho das a baragi hermit finding the baragi absent and hearing that he possessed such skill and magic that he could overthrow any one who sat on his couch the guru proceeded to sit thereon and make himself at home he shot one of the baragi's goats and cooked and ate the flesh a disciple went to inform the baragi of the guru's proceedings it was a sacrilege to kill an animal at the baragi's seat and another sacrilege to take possession of the couch which served him as a throne he came to demand an explanation of the intruder's strange conduct the baragi represented that the place had been first his guru's seat then his own and he did not desire to have it usurped by an unknown stranger who moreover committed violence and sacrilege the guru replied that he had arrived fatigued in nander and having heard of the baragi's hospitality and philanthropy took the liberty of testing the favourable accounts he had received the bairagi accepted the guru's explanation recognized from his words and manner that he was a great man and called himself his banda slave the name by which he was subsequently known banda whose original name was lachmandev was son of ramdev rajput and native of rajari in the himalayan state of punch before he adopted a religious role he had been a zamindar or cultivator in early years he practised the use of firearms and was devoted to the chase once when he shot a female deer he found two young ones in her womb he was so distressed at what he had done that he decided to renounce the world and became a disciple of a fakir named janki prasad as a wandering mendicant he made his way to the source of the godavari at nasik he there made himself a hut and began to perform austerities a yogi called luni visited him and instructed him in the science of yog and incantations being thus accomplished he set out again on his travels and followed the source of the godavari until he arrived in nander 
there he became known as a holy man in possession of many charms for the acquisition of spiritual and temporal advantages he used to pray and perform penance on a little mound overlooking the godavari and thence at intervals watch its slow and dreamy motion as if it were loath to lose itself in the open sea the guru was pleased with the position and seclusion of nander and decided to make it his permanent abode he used to sit in prayer and meditation on a small stone structure on the margin of the river near it is a little larger building where the granth sahib was read it is now and has been for years in a state of dilapidation the guru instructed banda in the tenets of his religion and in due time baptized him according to the new rites on that occasion banda received the name gurbakhsh singh but continued to be known as banda he conceived a great affection for the true religious guide he had at last found and one day asked him if there were any service he could perform for him the guru after reflection found that he had an account to settle with the muhammadans of the punjab and replied i have come into the world to consolidate the faith and destroy oppressors art thou prepared to assist me banda promised to undertake any enterprise suggested by the guru upon this he was enjoined to proceed to the punjab and wreak vengeance on the enemies of the khalsa thou hast called thyself my slave said the guru but thou shalt be the most exalted of all saying this the guru presented him with five arrows and thus addressed him as long as thou remainest continent thy glory shall increase he who is continent turneth not away from the combat and his opponents cannot withstand him the continent man succeedeth in everything once thou forsakest the khalsa principles and associatest unlawfully with woman thy courage shall depart he then ordered banda to proceed towards the jamna wait at a little distance from Buria for reinforcements which he would cause to be sent him then go to sadhara Buria and sadhara are both in the present district of ambala and plunder and devastate it the reason was that the muhammadans of the place had caused budu shah and his disciples to be executed by the emperor for the offence of having assisted the guru at the battle of bangani when banda had disposed of the guru's enemies at sandhara he was to proceed to sack some more muhammadan cities then march to sarhind and put its governor wazir khan to death the guru gave him instructions to cut off wazir khan's head with his own hands and not entrust this pious duty to any subordinate this done banda was commissioned to go to the hills and search for the hill rajas who had so often and so cruelly persecuted the guru and mete out to them the same justice as to the mughal enemies of the khalsa with banda the guru dispatched baba binod singh his son baba khan singh descendants of guru angad and baz singh a descendant of guru amar das who were all three to give banda further instructions in the new religion he had adopted with these the guru sent five other sikhs to assist in the enterprise and support the martial fame of the khalsa after banda's departure the guru lived at various places in the immediate neighbourhood at the shikar ghat or game ferry whence he used to go hunting at the nagina ghat where a sikh presented him with a valuable signet ring which he flung into the river at the hira ghat where he disposed in a similar manner of a valuable diamond ring presented him by the emperor while in nander and at the spot now called the sagat sahib where he used to give religious instruction to his followers and expound to them the granth sahib while at the sangat sahib a Maltani sikh brought the guru an offering of a bow and two arrows he was much pleased and put the bow to the test by discharging one of the arrows from it he sent one of his followers to inquire where the arrow had fallen on being informed of the spot he said that was where he wished to reside the muhammadans objected but their objection was overruled by the emperor who made the guru a present of the land he went and abode there and made it the scene of his propaganda it is the place on which his shrine was subsequently erected after some time a pathan one day came and claimed from the guru a sum of eleven thousand rupees as the price of horses he had supplied him the guru had not sufficient funds to discharge the debt he said that thirty years after his decease the sikhs should be in power and the pathan had only to present the guru's acknowledgment 
of the debt to their leaders when he should receive the amount many hundredfold the debt was duly discharged by the sikhs under happier and more prosperous circumstances End of chapter thirty section thirty one of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty one the guru feeling that his end was approaching desired to send sahib kaur to her co-wife sundari whom he had left in dili on his departure to the south of india he knew that she could not endure the shock which his demise would cause her she at first refused to leave nander saying that she had made a vow never to take her daily food without seeing the guru and how could she fulfil her vow if she were to part from him the guru then gave her six weapons which had belonged to his grandfather guru har gobind and told her to look at them whenever she desired to behold him with these and other inducements he at last persuaded her to depart she was accompanied by bai mani singh and both were enjoined to comfort and console sundari the current sikh account of the guru's death is that he was stabbed by gul khan a grandson of painda khan in revenge for the death of the latter at the hands of guru har gobind more probable is the account given in one of the recensions of bahadur shah's history the guru was in the habit of constantly addressing assemblies of worldly persons religious fanatics and indeed all varieties of people one day an afghan who frequently attended these meetings was sitting listening to him when certain expressions which were disagreeable to the ears of the faithful fell from the guru's tongue the afghan was enraged and regardless of the guru's dignity and importance stabbed him twice or thrice with a poniard the emperor on hearing of the outrage dispatched some of his most skilful surgeons to attend to the guru's injuries and so skilfully did they perform their duty that the guru's wounds were nearly healed in a fortnight after which the surgeons took their leave as being no longer required in a short time the emperor again sent to inquire after the guru's health and made him several offerings which included two bows a discussion arose whether the guru could bend them on this he took up one and on bending it burst open his imperfectly healed wounds blood began to flow copiously the wound was bound up by the guru's attendants but this time it was past medicament the guru set apart five hundred rupees for the preparation and distribution of sacred food and one hundred rupees to purchase sandalwood and whatever else was necessary for his obsequies his sikhs came to him and said that while he was alive they had the benefit of his presence but they required instruction which might remind them of him hereafter and guide them to salvation the guru replied o oh, dear and beloved khalsa the immortal god's will can never be resisted he who is born must assuredly die guru arjan hath said everything we behold shall perish night and day are merely expressions of time it is the immortal god alone who ever abideth all other beings however holy and exalted must depart when the last moment allotted them arriveth for none can escape the primordial law of corporeal dissolution all this world composed of the five elements is death's prey when the materials perish how can the fabric remain god the creator and cherisher of all is alone immortal brahma vishnu shiv and the other gods of the hindus perished at their appointed time of what account is man wherefore o oh my friends it is not good to be unduly enamoured of this fragile body know that the light of the imperishable god whose attributes are permanence consciousness and happiness shineth ever in you wherefore always abide in cheerfulness and never give way to mourning god is ever the same he is neither young nor old he is not born neither doth he die he feeleth not pain or poverty know that the true guru abideth as he 
creatures who are steeped in bodily pride are very unhappy and night and day subject to love and hate ever entangled and involved in the deadly sins they perish by mutual enmity and at last find their abode in hell yet for the love of such creatures the guru assumed birth to deliver them he hath instructed them in the true name and very fortunate are they who have received and treasured his instruction by it they are enabled to save themselves and others from the perils of the world's ocean as when after drought rain falleth and there is abundance so the guru seeing human beings suffering and yearning for happiness came to bestow it on them and remove their sorrows by his teaching and as the rain remaineth where it falleth so the guru's instruction ever abideth with his disciples the sikhs who love the true guru are in turn beloved by him o khalsa remember the true name the guru hath arrayed you in arms to procure you the sovereignty of the earth those who have died in battle have gone to an abode of bliss i have attached you to the skirt of the immortal god and entrusted you to him read the granth sahib or listen to it so shall your minds receive consolation and you shall undoubtedly obtain an abode in the guru's heaven they who remember the true name render their lives profitable and when they depart enter the mansions of eternal happiness when the sikhs came again to take their last farewell of the guru they inquired who was to succeed him he replied i have entrusted you to the immortal god ever remain under his protection and trust to none besides wherever there are five sikhs assembled who abide by the guru's teachings know that i am in the midst of them he who serveth them shall obtain the reward thereof the fulfilment of all his heart's desires read the history of your gurus from the time of guru nanak henceforth the guru shall be the khalsa and the khalsa the guru i have infused my mental and bodily spirit into the granth sahib and the khalsa after this the guru bathed and changed his dress he then read the japji and repeated an ardus or supplication while doing so he gave instructions that no clothes should be bestowed as alms in his name he then put on a muslin waistband slung his his bow over his shoulder and took his musket in his hand he opened the granth sahib and placing five pais and a cocoa nut before it solemnly bowed to it as his successor then uttering wa guru ji ka khalsa wa guru ji ki vata he circumambulated the sacred volume and said o beloved khalsa let him who desireth to behold me behold the guru granth obey the granth sahib it is the visible body of the guru and let him who desireth to meet me diligently search its hymns the guru went to an enclosure formed of tent walls where his bier had been erected in the end of the night a watch before day he lay on his bier and directed all his sikhs except by santok singh who was specially attached to him to go to their homes he then gave his last orders to his last attendant keep my kitchen ever open and receive offerings for its maintenance if any one erect a shrine in my honour his offspring shall perish by santok singh represented that the sikhs were few at nander and how were offerings to be obtained the guru replied o bai santok singh have patience singhs of mine of very great eminence shall come here and make copious offerings everything shall be obtained by the favour of guru nanak he then in grateful acknowledgment of the spiritual benefactions of the founder of his religion uttered a persian distich the translation of which is gobind singh obtained from guru nanak hospitality the sword victory and prompt assistance the guru then breathed his last the sikhs made preparations for his obsequies as he had instructed them the sohila was solemnly chanted and sacred food distributed while all were mourning the loss of the guru a hermit arrived and said you suppose that the guru is dead i saw him this very morning riding his bay horse when i bowed to him he said come o hermit let me behold thee very happy am i that i have met thee at the last moment i then asked him whither he was wending his way he smiled and said he was going to the forest on a hunting excursion he had his bow in his hand and his arrows were fastened with a strap to his waist the sikhs who heard this statement arrived at the conclusion that it was all the guru's play that he dwelt in uninterrupted bliss and that he showed himself wherever he was remembered 
he had merely come into the world they said to make trial of their faith and remove the ills of existence wherefore for such a guru who had departed bodily to heaven there ought to be no mourning the ashes of his bier were collected and a platform built over them the khalsa to whom the guruship had been entrusted declared that all those who visited the spot should receive due spiritual reward the guru departed from the scene of his earthly triumphs and reverses on thursday the fifth day of the bright half of kartik sambat seventeen hundred and sixty five a d seventeen hundred and eight having exercised spiritual and temporal sovereignty over the sikhs for three and thirty years and resided in nander for fourteen months and ten days the sikh temple at nander called ab chal nagar is an imposing structure with a cupola and two minarets the interior is surrounded by a wall of martial implements emblematic of the militant side of the guru's character it was built by maharaja ranjit singh in eighteen hundred and thirty two in defiance of the guru's interdiction additions are being continually made to the edifice by the contributions of devout sikhs End of chapter thirty one section thirty two of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty two we now proceed to continue the history of banda having set out for the punjab in accordance with the guru's instructions and in due time taken up his post on an eminence near buria he found there the reinforcements promised by the guru they came in numbers and clamoured for food to supply themselves they were obliged to resort to forcible measures upon this there arose a violent altercation between the sikhs and the villagers in which the latter were put to the sword the inhabitants of two or three other villages were similarly treated on seeing the license granted to banda's troops all the robbers of the country flocked to his standard an outcry everywhere arose and the people went in large numbers to complain to the governor of mustafabad a city five or six miles to the west of berea where were two thousand imperial troops under arms and ready for any emergency these were dispatched with two large guns against banda whereupon many of his mercenary recruits deserted him he encouraged all who remained and promised them protection and pecuniary assistance he then pulled forth one of the guru's arrows drew a line on the ground with it and said that no bullet or arrow should cross the demarcation thus made upon this his troops rallied and made such a successful defence that the mohammedans all fled leaving their cannon behind them after this victory several of the deserters returned and rejoined banda's army his forces then proceeded to mustafabad and laid it waste banda's next expedition was against sandhara the imperial troops stationed there came forth to oppose him but were easily defeated they fled and took shelter behind their city walls banda's forces with great bravery captured the fort and levelled it with the ground then ensued a general massacre of the inhabitants banda next marched and laid siege to samana a considerable town in the state of patiala here there was a sanguinary battle the city was sacked and the male inhabitants put to the sword he then proceeded to sarhind on the march his troops took supplies forcibly from villagers wazir khan on hearing that banda was marching against him sent to the viceroy of lahore for assistance banda plundered ambala on the way he then marched to banur where he was encountered by wazir khan's army which had marched from sarhind to oppose him the battle began on the following day when several of the mohammedans were slain wazir khan and banda engaged in single combat banda thus addressed him o sinner thou art the enemy of guru gobind singh thou hast shown him no respect 
but on the contrary hast put to death his innocent children and thereby committed a grievous and unpardonable crime the punishment for which i am now going to deal thee thine army and thy country shall be destroyed at my hands upon this banda struck off his head with one blow of his sword then the whole of the mohammedan army fled followed by the sikhs who possessed themselves of their horses arms tents cannon and other munitions of war and then advanced in triumph to sarhind there they effected a general massacre the sikhs captured sukhanand who had instigated the murder of guru gobind singh's children they put an iron ring in his nose and passing a rope through it led him round the streets to beg at every shop he was shoe-beaten until he died such of the inhabitants as were not killed prostrated themselves before the conqueror he was not disposed to mercy but gave an order to raise the city to the ground and plough up its site in the process large treasure was found which materially assisted him in his further career of rapine bloodshed and devastation banda then went on an expedition to the east and plundered most of the hill rajah's states after this he made a pilgrimage to anandpur and performed reverent worship at the shrine of guru teg bahadur he then made pilgrimages to the places hallowed by the visits of guru gobind singh the rajah of chamba in order to conciliate him sent him a supremely beautiful girl she had large eyes her limbs were graceful and delicate and she is described by the enthusiastic chronicler as the very image of the goddess of love banda on seeing her parted with his caution and completely forgot the guru's injunctions he dived into the ocean of sensuality and thought not of the fate that awaited him on the forfeiture of his continence having subjected all the hill chiefs banda planned a tour in the bist doab and proceeded to jalandhar where he killed the mohammedan male inhabitants the mohammedan women were converted to sikhism and became wives of the sikh soldiers by the ceremony of anand he thence went into the manjaha and plundered batala thence he marched to lahore and put its viceroy aslam khan and all his principal officers to the sword he there heard that troops sent by the emperor bahadur shah were marching against him he proceeded to meet them as far as ludhiana and defeated them he thence went on a pilgrimage to the shrine of guru nanak in the gurdaspur district where he met bhai ram kaur sixth in descent from bhai buddha banda induced him to remain with him probably with the object of persuading him in imitation of his pious ancestor to invest him with the dignity of guru banda had by this time obtained supreme power from the neighbourhood of dili on the south to lahore on the north he appointed his own police levied revenue and ruled the country baba binad singh whom the guru had sent with him gave him great assistance in administration he endeavoured to dissuade him from the chamba liaison and another of a disreputable character which banda had also contracted on one occasion when baba binad singh remonstrated in open darbar with him for his departure from ascetic principles and the injunctions of the guru an altercation arose of such a, a violent character that binad singh drew his sword and would have cut off his head had not khan singh interposed khan singh then foretold the departure of banda's glory and his ignominious death banda next paid a visit to the great temple at amritsar he gave out that he had been empowered by the guru to claim succession to the guruship the sikhs then reflected that he did not live according to the rules prescribed for the khalsa in order to make trial of him they put meat before him at which he as the result of early prejudice became horrified he fell into a passion with the sikhs who had thus made trial of him and they in turn grew enraged with him for refusing meat allowed by their religion and for his manifold irregularities the result was that the sikhs divided into two factions those who rejected banda were called the tat khalsa or real sikhs and those who accepted him 
the bandai khalsa or followers of banda for the sikh salutation wa guru ji ka khalsa wa guru ji ki fata he substituted fata darshan victory to the sect an alteration which was deemed apostasy from the orthodox faith another cause of the dissatisfaction of the sikhs with banda was that he disregarded a letter of mata sundari to the effect that he had now accomplished the mission imposed on him by the guru namely to bring the governor of sarhind to justice and it was time for him to arrest his career of carnage and spoliation banda said that as mata sundari was only a woman she was not competent to give him advice or orders many sikhs thinking that this was a slight to the guru's wife deserted banda and from that time his power began rapidly to decline when the defeat of the army sent by the emperor against banda was heard of in nander it was attributed to the emperor's failure to keep his promise to the guru banda continued to pursue his violent career until bahadur shah himself at the head of a powerful avenging army proceeded against him banda not deeming his troops sufficient to cope with the imperial host fled to the mountains and took refuge in a fort called logar the imperial army besieged him but the wily chief escaped in a desperate sally a hindu who remained behind to personate him was sent by the subadar's orders to be executed in dihli very soon after this the emperor died in lahore and then ensued the usual oriental scramble for the throne his eldest son jahandar shah who has been described as a drunken profligate succeeded but was murdered by his nephew farooq siyar son of bahadur shah's second son azim ul shan while the struggle was in progress banda came forth from his hiding-place and again commenced his depredations bayazid khan the new viceroy of sarhind went forth with his troops to oppose banda but was killed while at his prayers by a follower of the outlaw on this the emperor farooq siyar sent abd ul samad khan also known as diller jang to arrest banda's progress when diller jang thought his troops had surrounded banda there was no banda to be seen he and his followers had again fled and disappeared in the mountains diler jang took up his quarters at lahore to await the outlaw's reappearance after a year banda again emerged from his fastnesses and took possession of kala nuar and santokgar he sent letters in all directions inviting the sikhs to join his standard in two months he received considerable reinforcements and defeated sher muhammad daim the general commanding at ambala the latter then went to diler jang at lahore to complain of banda's lawlessness and tyranny and concert more stringent measures for his repression diler jang sent the ambala general's complaint to the emperor upon this the emperor ordered mir ahmad khan the general commanding at aurangabad to join his forces with those of diler jang and the other generals in the panjab and all proceed against banda the latter took refuge in gurdaspur and strongly entrenched himself the mohammedan army besieged him the sikhs were reduced to such extremities that they killed for food all animals in their possession baba banad singh who had hitherto accompanied banda now abandoned him banda when rendered totally helpless sent a letter under flag of truce to diler jang offering to surrender if his life was spared and his troops treated with consideration diler jang promised to intercede with the emperor for him and held out hopes of his pardon when banda gave up his arms he was not allowed an interview with diler jang but placed at once with all his followers under restraint they were all sent to dihli with many circumstances of disgrace banda himself being put into an iron cage to be disposed of by the emperor here english testimony is available the members of an english mission who went from calcutta to dihli in seventeen hundred and fifteen to petition the emperor for certain privileges have left on record that they saw a procession of eight hundred sikh prisoners march through dihli with two thousand bleeding heads borne aloft on poles the sikhs vied with one another for precedence in death 
while the executions were in progress the mother of one of the prisoners a young man just arrived at manhood having obtained some influential support pleaded the cause of her son with great feeling and earnestness before the emperor she represented that her son had suffered imprisonment and hardship at the hands of the sect his property was plundered and he was made prisoner while in captivity he was without any fault of his own introduced into the sect and now stood innocent among those sentenced to death farouk siyar pitied the woman and mercifully sent an officer with orders to release the youth she arrived with the order of release just as the executioner was standing with his bloody sword upheld over the young man's head when she showed the imperial order the youth broke out into complaints saying my mother speaketh falsely i with heart and soul join my fellow-believers in devotion to the guru send me quickly after my companions needless to say his request was cheerfully granted here baba khan singh and baba baz singh whom the guru had sent with banda succeeded in effecting their escape gulam husain khan author of the siyar ul matakarin states that banda's son was put on his lap and banda was obliged to cut his throat in the manner of mohammedan sacrifice he did so not unwillingly lest the child should afterwards be circumcised and made a mohammedan mohammed amin khan when he had an interview with banda said to him the marks of sense and intelligence are visible on thy countenance how is it thou hast never thought about the recompense of thy deeds and that in a short span of life with a dreadful futurity thou hast been guilty of such cruelty and of such detestable actions to hindus and mussulmans he replied in all religions and sects whenever disobedience and rebellion among mortal men passeth all bounds the great avenger raiseth up a severe man like me for the punishment of their sins and the due reward of their deeds when he wisheth to desolate the world he placeth dominion in the hands of a tyrant when he desireth to give the tyrant the recompense of his works he sendeth a powerful man like thee to prevail over him and to give him his due reward in this world as thou and i can see on this banda's flesh was torn from his body by red-hot pincers and he expired under the horrible torture during his execution he uttered the following warning to his fellow-creatures who hath not suffered for his acts who hath not reaped what he hath sown forget not that you shall obtain retribution for your deeds wheat springeth from wheat and barley from barley though such was the fate of banda yet guru gobind singh had infused such martial spirit into his sikhs that they not long after obtained possession of the panjab and put an end to mohammedan supremacy end of chapter thirty two section thirty three of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty three mata sahib kaur the guru's youngest wife died of grief very soon after her husband she was cremated at the shrine of guru har krishan in dili when ajit singh the boy adopted by mata sundari the guru's remaining wife grew up she provided him with a wife he begot a son called hathi singh ajit singh imitated the late guru as much as possible he used to hold court call himself a guru and entertain a retinue he endeavoured to obtain from mata sundari the arms belonging to guru har gobind which the late guru had given to sahib kaur on her departure from nander ajit singh believed that if he wore them every one would hail him as guru when he made his demand for the arms he was sharply reproved by mata sundari on this he drew his dagger to kill her but some friends interposed mata sundari then cursed him said he should forfeit his faith and die an untimely death one day as he was riding in the bazaar his herald said to him 
o guru behold the muhammadans praying the muhammadans overheard this and believing that he ridiculed their religion reported to the emperor that under a muhammadan administration the sikhs were mocking the faithful the emperor at the instigation of the quazis ordered ajit singh to cut off his hair and appear thus humbled before him if he failed in this the emperor reserved to himself the right to punish him as he thought fit ajit singh fearing death cut off his hair and grovelled before the emperor mata sandari was enraged on hearing of this act of apostasy and told him never again to show her his face she drew up a document to the effect that though she had adopted and cherished ajit singh as a son she now renounced him she then entrusted guru har gobind's arms to the faithful sikhs of dihli and expressed her desire to live no longer in such an evil and ill-omened city the sikhs however prevailed on her to alter her determination ajit singh now abandoned by the sikhs went to beg at mata sundari's door she sent him money but would never consent to see him a muhammadan fakir on whom ajit singh when in good circumstances used to bestow money one day met him in the dili bazaar and asked for alms ajit singh in his poverty could only give him a few copper coins the fakir was not satisfied but followed him to his house and further importuned him he would not leave but dogged his steps as he went shooting during the afternoon ajit singh complained to his servants of the annoyance the beggar was causing him whereupon they beat the man so severely that he died they disposed of his body by throwing it into a well for the purpose of concealment the fakir's fate gradually became known and the emperor ordered ajit singh to be arrested and brought before him ajit singh refused to obey the order and put himself in a posture of defence his house was besieged and his adherents fought bravely to protect him he contrived to send his wife and son hathi singh both disguised in soiled clothes to mata sundari he then succeeded in escaping from his house and concealed himself in a straw stack belonging to hindus who lived near the owner of the stack discovered him and on hearing that a proclamation had been issued for his arrest informed the authorities ajit singh was seized tied to an elephant's tail and dragged through the city at a turning in one of the streets the elephant trod on his head upon which his brains oozed out mata sundari thinking her position unsafe in dihli on account of having received ajit singh's wife and son put into execution her long-cherished project of abandoning that city and proceeded with her charge to bhagatgarh the headman of, of the place would not allow her through fear of the emperor to remain in his city she thence went to mathura where she was received with great distinction the governor of the city induced the raja of jaipur to grant her the revenue of two villages and also a suitable place of residence in mathura hathi singh grew up to manhood adopted his father's style and maintained a retinue of sixty mounted orderlies he tried to compose hymns but inspiration failed him he then abstracted some from the granth sahib and wherever the name nanak occurred inserted his own mata sundari on being informed of this became very wroth abandoned hathi singh and his mother at mathura and returned to dihli during the invasion of ahmad shah hathi singh fled from mathura to burhanpur where he subsequently died leaving no male issue when mata sundari arrived in dihli she by the kind offices of raja ram the emperor's minister obtained possession of her house and property which had been seized by the muhammadans after her departure she spent the remainder of her days there and died in comparative worldly comfort in sambat eighteen hundred and four 
a d seventeen hundred and forty seven her body was cremated near the shrine of guru har krishan it will be remembered that when the guru evacuated anandpur he sent gulab rai and sham singh with a letter to the raja of nahan requesting him to grant them the means of subsistence the raja gave them two villages gulab rai afterwards purchased anandpur for sixty thousand rupees from the kalur raja and returned to live there he caused himself to be worshipped by the sikhs and carried his unseemly pretensions so far as to actually install himself in the guru's seat sadhu gur baksh who had been an attendant on the guru and had by him been left in charge of guru teg bahadur's shrine remonstrated against the usurpation whereupon gulab rai became very angry and addressed him in offensive language gur baksh then cursed him saying thou and thy line shall perish in a short time gulab rai and his two sons died after that gulab rai's widow took the offerings of the sikhs and remained in possession of anandpur when she was on the point of death she appointed sir john singh sham singh's son now old and experienced as heir of anandpur his descendants still occupy that city and receive a yearly revenue from the indian government and the sikh states a sikh writer called gurdas who lived long after the time of guru gobind singh wrote a war in his praise which the sikhs appended to the compositions of bai gur das and which now appears as the forty-first war the following paris are extracted from it pari fifteen guru gobind was manifested as the tenth avatar he repeated the name of the creator who is unseen eternal and stainless he established the khalsa a sect of his own and gave it great glory wearing long hair he grasped the sword and smote all his enemies he put on the kach of continents and practised arms he established the sikh war cry and was victorious in mighty battles he caused all demon enemies to be surrounded and trampled upon then his endless praise was gradually proclaimed throughout the world thus arose the race of singhs who wore blue clothes who killed all the hostile turks and repeated god's name no one could withstand them so the turkish leaders decamped rajas kings and amirs all became the dust beneath the singhs feet great hills trembled when they heard their victorious drums there was then great commotion throughout the whole world the enemy abandoned their homes and perished in the great confusion and trouble that ensued there is none so great a destroyer of fear as the true guru he handled and displayed such a sword as none could withstand well done well done gobind singh thou wert at once guru and disciple pari sixteen by the order of the immortal god the great guru obtained inspiration then he gradually established the khalsa whole-bodied and manly then arose the roaring of the singhs lions which terrified the whole world they levelled with the earth the shrines of hindus and mohammedans they cancelled the veds the purans the six hindu systems and the koran they abolished the call to prayer and the prayer carpet of the mohammedans and killed the turkish monarchs temporal and spiritual leaders all hid themselves or became converted to sikhism the mullahs and the qazis grew weary of reading but found not god's secret hundreds of thousands of pandits brahmans and astrologers have become entangled in worldly affairs worshipping stones and temples they had become exceedingly superstitious both the hindus and the mohammedans were altogether engaged in deception consequently a third religion the khalsa arose and became renowned the singhs by the order of guru gobind singh seized the sword and wielded it they killed all their enemies and caused the name of the immortal god to be repeated then god's order was promulgated in the world 
the drum of victory resounded and drowned the cry of sorrow the great sagacious guru established a third sect well done well done gobind singh thou wert at once guru and disciple End of life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty three section thirty four of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain compositions of guru gobind singh extracts from al kal ustat in the year a d seventeen hundred and thirty four while in amritsar by mani singh compiled the compositions and translations of guru gobind singh and of the bards who were associated with him the compilation was subsequently known as the granth of the tenth guru though mani singh did not give it that title we now proceed to give translations from it of such doctrinal and historical portions as we believe to represent the guru's own opinions and acts jop there is one god the true the great and the bounteous the tenth guru spoke with his holy mouth god hath no quoit or marks no colour no caste no lineage no form no complexion no outline no costume none can in any way describe him he is immovable fearless luminous and measureless in might he is accounted king of kings lord of millions of indars he is sovereign of the three worlds demigods men and demons the woods and dales declare him indescribable o lord who can tell all thy names the wise call thee special names according to thy deeds i call ustat praise of the immortal may we have the protection of the immortal being may we have the protection of all steel may we have the protection of all death may we have the protection of all steel i bow to the one primal god who extended sea and land and nether regions and the firmament he is the primal being unseen and immortal his light is manifest in the fourteen worlds he is contained in the ant as in the elephant he deemeth the rich and the poor alike he is unequalled unseen and eternal he is the searcher of all hearts he is invisible indestructible and without distinguishing dress he is without passion colour form or outline he is devoid of caste marks of every kind he is the primal being peerless and changeless he hath no enemy no friend no father no mother he is far from all and near all his dwelling is in sea and land and nether and upper regions boundless is his form and boundless his voice in the shelter of his feet dwelleth bawani brahma and vishnu have not found his limits the four-faced brahma pointeth out that god is indescribable he made millions of indars and bawans he created and destroyed brahmas and sheaves the fourteen worlds he made as a play and again blended them with himself he made endless demons deities serpents celestial singers yakshas excellent and beautiful he is spoken of in the past the future and the present and he knoweth the secrets of every heart he is not attached to any one love he is contained in the light of all souls he recognizeth all people in all places he is free from death and immortal he is the invisible imperceptible being distinct from all the world he is immortal and decaying imperishable and of changeless purpose he is the destroyer and creator of all he is the remover of sickness sorrow and sin he who with single heart meditateth on him even for a moment shall not fall into death's noose thou art without sorrow without form yet beautiful the king of kings the giver of great gifts the preserver of life the giver of milk and sons the remover of sickness and sorrow sometimes honourable and inspiring great honour 
thou art a student of science an unrivalled incarnation thou appearest as a cid thou art the glory of purity thou art the net of youth the death of death the torment of enemies the life of friends the following ten sawayas or quatrains are recited at the administration of the pahal or baptism according to the rites of the tenth guru one i have wandered and in their own homes seen crowds of saravajis sudes seeds yogis and yadis brave demons demigods feasting on nectar and crowds of saints of various sects i have seen the religions of all countries but none appeared to be that of the lord of life without a particle of the love and favour of god they are only worth a rati two emperors before whom strong-armed kings used to lowly bow their heads in countless numbers who possess proud elephants with golden trappings incomparable tall painted with bright colours millions of horses which bounded like deer and were fleeter than the wind what mattered it how great those emperors were they at last departed barefooted three though they roamed and conquered all countries beating their various drums though many beautiful elephants trumpeted loud and thousands of horses of royal breed neighed for them who can number such kings in the past the future and the present they cannot be counted yet without worshipping the name of god the lord of wealth they went at last to their final home four men bathe at places of pilgrimage exercise mercy curb their passions bestow gifts exercise abstinence and perform various special ceremonies the veds the parans the koran and the other books of the mussulmans the earth and heaven all have i seen thousands of fasters yatis who practise continence all have i carefully observed yet without worshipping the name of the one god and loving him even kings are of no account five trained soldiers powerful irresistible well accoutred with coats of mail crush their enemies filled with high martial spirit they would put mountains to flight themselves unshaken they would shatter their enemies destroy rebels crush the pride of furious elephants yet without the favour of god the lord of wealth they should all depart at last and leave the world six countless heroes very valiant without hesitation face the edge of the sword subdue countries crush rebels and the pride of furious elephants break powerful forts and even without fighting conquer in every direction but their efforts avail not the lord is the commander of them all the suppliants are many while there is but one giver seven even the demons gods serpents and ghosts who repeat god's name in the past future and present all the beings which in sea and land every moment set up god in their hearts shall find their good deeds and glory increase they shall hear the voices of gratulation and the multitude of their sins shall depart the congregations of saints wander happy in the world all their enemies on beholding them are cowed eight lords of men and elephants rulers who reign in the three worlds who perform millions of ablutions make gifts of elephants and other animals and marry brides at various splendid swayamvars they with brahma shiv vishnu and indar shall at last be entangled and fall into death's noose but they who touch the feet of the lord of wealth shall not again resume a body nine what availeth it to sit closing both eyes and meditating like a crane this world is lost and the next also for those who go about bathing in the seven seas they pass their lives in vain dwelling in the midst of sin i speak verily hear me all ye people they who love god have obtained him ten 
some worshipping stones put them on their heads some suspend lingams from their necks some see god in the south some bow their heads to the west some fools worship idols others busy themselves with worshipping the dead the whole world entangled in false ceremonies hath not found god's secret god is not subject to birth or death he is acquainted with the excellent fourteen sciences he is without stain and infinite he is of unfading brightness and generous his form is not quickly recognized he is head of the saints of the whole world he is the highest object of praise by him the earth and sun are supported he is the treasury of the eighteen supernatural powers he is the dispeller of sorrow in all the worlds he is not subject to time to death or to karma he is versed in all religious ceremonies his glory is infrangible and unequalled he established all establishment he is without sorrow indivisible and impenetrable brahma by his four veds sings his praises the veds speak of him as indescribable brahma speaks of him as endless his glory is unknowable and unequalled indivisible immeasurable and unestablished by any one he made the extension of the world he created it with the utmost thought his form is endless and infrangible his glory is peerless and dazzling he is invisible and noble he made millions of indars and kings many brahmas and vishnus who meditate on him many rams krishans and prophets no one is acceptable without devotion there are many oceans mountains great as bind many fishes tortoises and serpents many deities and sons of brahma many incarnations of krishan and vishnu many indars to sweep before his door many veds and brahmas many rudars and bawans and many unequalled rams and krishans many men recite amatory poetry many tell the secrets of the veds many recite the shastars and simritis and some read the purans many perform fire sacrifices many painful penances with bodies reversed many lift their arms in the fashion of the sannyasis some down the garb of yogis and abandon the world some perform the niwali feet some practise painful fasting some go on pilgrimages and give boundless alms some are generous in their worldly acts some perform unequal burnt offerings some obtain regal state and dispense justice some act according to the shastars and the simritis and some in opposition to the veds many wander in different countries and many remain fixed in one place some pray in water some endure five fires on their bodies some dwell in the forest some perform the endless duties of a family man some are generous in the fashion of kings some are free from sickness and error some perform good and others bad acts some pose as shaikhs others as brahmans some perform the duties of kings in an incomparable manner some are free from bodily and mental suffering some are subject to the service of a special god some are poor others the sons of kings and some are the incarnations of vayas many brahmas read the vedas and many shesnags repeat god's name some are bairagis others sannyasis and some wander in the guise of udasis know that all these things are vain and that all such religion is fruitless without the support of the one name deem all religious ceremonies as superstition god is in the water god is in the dry land god is in the heart god is in the forest god is in the mountain god is in the cave god is in the earth god is in heaven god is here god is there god is in space god is in time god is invisible god is without a garb god is without sin god is without enmity god is deathless god is uncherished god is impenetrable god is invulnerable god is not moved by charms or spells god has his own light he cannot be moved by incantations god is without caste god is without lineage god is without friends god hath no mother god feeleth no physical or mental suffering god is without doubt god hath no karma god is invincible god is fearless god is infrangible god is indissoluble 
god cannot be punished god is radiant god is transcendent god is inscrutable repeat god's name establish god's name in thy heart do penance unto god and repeat his name thou o god art in the water thou art in the dry land thou art in the river thou art in the sea thou art in the tree thou art in its leaves thou art in the earth thou art in the firmament thy name is repeated again and again thy name is fixed in man's heart thou art space thou art time thou art the occupant thou art the place thou art unborn thou art fearless thou art impalpable thou art indestructible thou art continence thou art fasting thou art deliverance thou art wisdom thou alone art thou alone art the following is a satire on various penances and austerities practised by hindu sects in india swine eat filth elephants and donkeys bespatter themselves with dust jackals live at places of cremation owls live in tombs deer wander alone in the forest trees ever die in silence the man who restraineth his seed should only have the credit of the hermaphrodite monkeys ever wander barefooted how shall the wretch who is subject to a woman and devoted to lust and wrath be saved without the knowledge of the one god it is known that demons live in the forest all children on earth drink milk and serpents live on air they who eat grass and renounce the desire of wealth are no more than calves and oxen they who fly in the heavens have only the attribute of birds they who engage in meditation resemble cranes cats and wolves all great guianes who knew but asserted not themselves never allowed such deceit as the above to enter their hearts even by mistake they who live in the earth should be called the offspring of worms they who live in the heavens should be called birds they who eat fruit should be called the offspring of monkeys they who wander unseen should be accounted as ghosts they who float on water are like ganjeris they who eat fire like chakors they who worship the sun have the attribute of the lotus they who worship the moon of water lilies the tortoise the fish and the shark may all be called narayan if you speak of god as kal nab the lake in which there is lotus is also kal nab if you speak of god as gopanath all gujars are gopanaths all cowherds gopals if you call god rikikesh that is a name taken by superiors of religious orders if you call god madhav that is the bumblebee kanaya is the name of the woodpecker if you speak of god as a destroyer of khans you speak of the myrmidons of death fools utter names but know not their meanings and worship not him by whom man is protected god is the protector and destroyer of the world compassionate to the poor punisher of enemies ever the cherisher and free from death's noose yogis wearers of matted hair celibates the true great brahmacharis who undergo hunger and thirst in their divine meditation they who perform the niwali feat who sacrifice to water fire and wind who hold their heads down who stand on one leg and never sit men serpents deities and demons find not god's secrets the veds and the books of the mussulman say that god is indescribable peacocks skip about dancing the thunder roareth and the lightning presenteth many phases if god be obtained by being cold or hot there is nothing colder than the moon nothing hotter than the sun if by being a raja god may be obtained there is no king equal to indar who filleth the whole world nowhere can be found a penitent like a shiv a reader of the veds like primal brahma or penitents like the sons of brahma yet without divine knowledge they are all subject to the noose of death and ever wander through the cycle of the ages one chief was born one died and one was born again there have also been many incarnations of ram chandar and krishan how many brahmas and vishnus have there been how many veds and purans how many collections of simratis have been and passed away how many preachers and madars how many casters and pollaxes how many ansavatars have succumbed to death how many priests and prophets have there been they are so many that they cannot be counted from dust they sprang and to dust they returned 
yogis yatis brahmacharis and very great kings the shadow of whose umbrellas extended for many miles who wandered subduing kingdoms and crushing the pride of very great kings sovereigns like man and lords of the umbrella like de lip great kings who prided themselves on the strength of their arms proud men like dara like the kings of dili and like durjadhan having enjoyed the earth in their turn at last were blended with it artillerymen huntsmen wearing decoy dresses and they who eat opium bow their heads many times what availeth it that men perform prostrations of different kinds to god they are like wrestlers practising the exercise of donned what availeth it that men lie with their faces turned up if they do not heartily bow to the supreme god they are only as sick men how can he who is the slave of worldly desires and ever clever in obtaining wealth obtain the one lord of the world without faith in him he into whose ear an earwig hath entered shaketh his head he who hath lost a friend or son beateth his head in mourning for grazing on ak eating fruits and flowers and ever wandering in the forests there is no animal like a goat what if a sheep rub its head against trees and thus take off its hair as for eating earth call the leech and ask it how can he who is a slave to worldly desires and addicted to lust and wrath find god without faith the peacocks dance the frogs croak and the clouds ever thunder the tree ever standeth on one leg in the forest as for those who take not life the saravaji bloweth on the ground before putting his feet on it the stones through several ages remain in one place the ravens and the kites travel from country to country how can the wretch who is without divine knowledge and who is never absorbed in the great benefactor be saved without faith in him like an actor man sometimes poseth as a yogi or bairagi sometimes he assumeth the guise of a sannyasi sometimes he appeareth to live on air sometimes he sitteth in an attitude of contemplation sometimes in his infatuation for pelf he singeth many praises of men sometimes he is a brahmachari sometimes he produceth a garden in his hand sometimes he holdeth a fakir's staff and deceiveth men's senses he who is subject to worldly desires danceth with gestures but being devoid of divine knowledge how shall he obtain heaven in the cold season the jackal barketh five times and the elephant and the donkey utter various cries what availeth it to be cut in twain by the saw at benares thieves cut men in pieces and kill them with axes what availeth it that a fool hath put a halter round his neck and drowned himself in the ganges thags put men to death by putting halters round their necks without meditation on divine knowledge fools are drowned in hell's river and without faith how can there be any such meditation if any one were to obtain by penance the lord who suffereth not pain the wounded man suffereth pain of many kinds if any one were by repeating god's name to obtain god who cannot be obtained by lip-worship the warbler ever uttereth too high too high if any one were to obtain god by flying in the heavens the bird called and wandereth in the firmament if salvation be obtained by burning oneself in the fire why should not the sati and also the serpent which liveth in hell be saved the following is a homily on the equality of men and on the hindu and mohammedan forms of worship one man by shaving his head is accepted as a sannyasi another as a yogi or a brahmachari a third as a yati some men are hindus and others mussulmans among the latter are rafazis imams and shafais know that all men are of the same caste karta the creator and karim the beneficent are the same razak the provider and rahim the merciful are the same let no man even by mistake suppose there is a difference worship the one god who is the one divine guru for all know that his form is one and that he is the one light diffused in all the temple and the mosque are the same the hindu worship and the mussulman prayer are the same all men are the same it is through error they appear different 
deities demons yakshas heavenly singers mussulmans and hindus adopt the customary dress of their different countries all men have the same eyes the same ears the same body the same build a compound of earth air fire and water allah and abhek are the same the purans and the koran are the same they are all alike it is the one god who created all the following gives the sikh conception of the manner in which souls emanated from god and are again absorbed in him as from one fire millions of sparks arise though rising separately they unite again in the fire as from one heap of dust several particles of dust fill the air and on filling it again blend with the dust as in one stream millions of waves are produced the waves being made of water all become water so from god's form non-sentient and sentient things are manifested and springing from him shall all be united in him again how many tortoises and fishes and how many eaters of them how many excellent young animals become strong-winged and fly how many birds of prey in the firmament eat the excellent birds and how many animals eat and digest the birds of prey when they see them what mattereth it whether things live in water or land or fly in the firmament god made them and will destroy them all as light blendeth with darkness and darkness with light so all things have sprung from god and shall be united in him how many go about howling how many die weeping how many are drowned in the water how many are burnt in the fire how many dwell by the ganges how many in medina and maka how many wander as anchorets how many undergo the pain of being cut by the saw how many of burying themselves in the earth how many of being impaled how many fly in the firmament how many dwell in water but they shall all be burnt in the fire for want of divine knowledge the demigods have grown weary searching for god the archdemons have grown weary striving with him the wise have grown weary exercising their wisdom they who repeat his name have grown weary of watching men have grown weary of grinding and applying sandal to themselves they have grown weary of applying excellent attar of roses they have grown weary of worshipping stones and offering them pudding they have grown weary of visiting cemeteries and yogis places of burial they have grown weary of smearing walls and of being marked with the brand of idols the celestial musicians have grown weary of singing all the canars have grown weary of their penance but none of them have found god the following is guru gobind singh's conception of the divinity god is without passion without colour without form without outline he is without worldly love without anger without enmity without jealousy he is without karma without error without birth and without caste he hath no friend no enemy no father no mother he hath no worldly love no house no desires no home he hath no son no friend no enemy no wife he is invisible without distinguishing dress and unborn he is ever the bestower of supernatural power and wisdom he is of size beyond measure his form and outline cannot be known nor where he dwelleth nor in what disguises he wandereth nor what his name is nor what he is called how shall i describe him he cannot be described he hath no disease or sorrow or worldly love or mother no karma no superstition no birth no caste he hath no jealousy no garb and is unborn i bow to him as one i bow to him as one he is beyond all things and from the beginning the dispenser of wisdom he is indivisible indestructible primal peerless and imperishable he hath no caste or lineage or form or colour i bow to the primal and infrangible one how many millions of worms like krishan he created built fashioned again destroyed and created he is unfathomable fearless primal unrivalled imperishable he is beyond all things from the beginning and perfect in his splendour he feeleth nor mental nor bodily pain he is unfathomable his glory is infrangible he is from the beginning and his majesty is indestructible he hath no birth no death no caste no pain he is infrangible radiant unamerciable impossible to be controlled he hath no worldly love no home he hath affection for men and is his own master he is powerful cannot be anywhere contained radiant the torturer of enemies he cannot be depicted in the past the present or the future he is not rich or poor he hath no form or outline he feeleth not covetousness or mental anxiety he is not formed out of the elements he belongeth to no sect he hath no enemy no friend no worldly love no home he is eternal and ever contained in all things 
he beareth love to all he hath no lust no wrath no avarice no worldly love he is unborn indestructible primal peerless invisible he is not subject to birth or death he hath no caste no pain he hath no sickness no sorrow he is fearless and without affliction he is impenetrable indivisible without karma and without death he cannot be destroyed or defamed he is bright and without a cherisher he hath no father no mother no caste no body he hath no worldly love no home no doubt no fear he hath no form there is no king over him he hath no body no acts attached to him he hath no fear he cannot be killed or pierced he hath no doubts he is eternal ever present and of size beyond measure i bow to him as one i bow to him as one his glory is inexpressible he is from the beginning he is unassociated imperishable imperceptible and unestablished i bow to him as one i bow to him as one he hath no worldly love no home no grief no relation he is afar off pure undefiled none can behold him he hath no caste no lineage no friend no minister i bow to the one independent being i bow to the one independent being he hath no religion no superstition no shame no relation no armour no shield no karma no fear no enemy no friends no son i bow to the primal being i bow to the primal being the bodies of some undergo cold heat and rain some sit in one posture for an age some make efforts to study the science of yog men strive but even then find not god's limits some with their arms raised wander in different countries some scorch themselves between the sun and surrounding fires some recite the simratis the shastars the veds some expound amorous poetry others the books of the mohammedans some perform fire sacrifice some live on air some millions eat carrion some consume vegetables some milk some leaves but even so god becometh not manifest unto them the following sawayas also are sometimes read at the administration of the pahul one god ever cherisheth the poor saveth saints and destroyeth enemies birds beasts mountains snakes and kings all he ever cherisheth he cherisheth animals in sea and land he considereth not their evil acts compassionate to the poor an ocean of mercy he beholdeth man's sins but wearieth not of giving two he destroyeth misery and sin he crusheth an army of evil men in a moment he breaketh those unbreakable by human power he smiteth the very valiant but cherisheth love for those who truly love him vishnu the lord of lakshmi cannot find his limit the vedas and the books of the mussulmans cannot utter his secret the beneficent one ever beholdeth men's secrets yet he becometh not angry and withholdeth not their daily bread three he made worms moths deer serpents the past the future and the present the demigods and demons were ruined through their pride they knew not god's secret and were led astray by error the veds the purans the koran and other mohammedan books have grown weary of taking god's account but they have not found it without the light of true love hath any one obtained the honour of finding god for he is primal endless and fathomable without enmity and fearless in the past future and present he is without end one out of many without blemish sin or stain and indestructible he is the creator and destroyer of worlds he supporteth life on sea and land compassionate to the poor a mind of mercy beautiful is the holy lord of wealth five he hath not lust or wrath or covetousness or worldly love or sickness or sorrow or enjoyment or fear he is without a body he beareth love to all yet is he devoid of sensual love he is homeless and indestructible to those who know him he giveth to those who know him not he also giveth he giveth to the earth he giveth to the heavens o man why waverest thou the beautiful and holy lord of wealth will care for thee six he preserveth men in many ways from sickness from sorrow from water and from sprites when enemies aim blows at us none of them may reach our bodies for he holdeth out his hand to protect us and hinder the army of sin from approaching us what else need i say to thee o man god protecteth thee with the screen of the womb seven the yakshas serpents demons demigods all meditate on thee the inscrutable one on earth and heaven and in the nether regions of hell yakshas serpents all bow their heads unto thee but they cannot find the limit of thy glory the veds describe thee as indescribable all the demigods who search for thee have grown weary of their search they have not found thee o god eight beings like narad brahma ramna 
the rikhi all combined to sing thy praises the veds and the books of the mussulmans have not found thy secret all have grown weary in their search god hath not been found by any one shiv the lord of yuma cannot find thy limit the sids with their spiritual leaders and the sons of brahma meditate on thee o men meditate in your hearts on him whose immeasurable power is diffused throughout the whole world nine the veds the purans the koran and other mussulman books have not found his secret all kings have grown sore weary searching for it they could not find the secret of the inscrutable after great travail they proclaimed him invulnerable thou o lord hast no passion no form no outline no colour no relation no sorrow no companion thou wast in the beginning and yet hadst no beginning thou art unfathomable without distinguishing dress and without jealousy he who repeateth thy name shall save his relations ten men have performed millions of ablutions at places of pilgrimage they have made many offerings and endured great fasts putting on the dress of great penitence and wearing long hair they have wandered in many countries but they have not found the beloved god they have made millions of attitudes of contemplation and prostrations many offerings of their limbs to tutelary divinities and blackened their faces but without meditating on the name of the compassionate to the poor the deathless they have at last gone to death's abode thou art the discharger of arms the holder of the earth and the umbrella the betrayer of kings the great tormentor of enemies the bestower of gifts the great enhancer of honour the giver of a resting-place the cutter of death's noose conqueror in the fight remover of obstacles great bestower of wisdom thou art honoured even among the most honoured thou art learned in divine knowledge thou art the great giver of wisdom the destroyer of the god of death the dwellers of the east know not thy limit the goddess hingula who dwelleth in the himalayas meditateth on thee the gur disease of gore sing the praises of thy name the yogis practise yog to be united with thee how many suspend their breath to obtain thee the arabs of arabia worship thy name the Farangis of france worship thee the kandaris and Quarishis know thee the residents of the west recognize thee as the object of their love the marathas and the magadis heartily do thee penance the natives of telang fix thee in their hearts and recognize thee as the abode of religion like milk in chirwad like buttermilk in chatranir like moonlight on the banks of the jamna like a female swan in turkey of the shias like a diamond in husainabad like the stream of the ganges when it blendeth with the seven seas like quicksilver in palagar like silver in rampur like saltpetre in surangabad like the champa flower in chandarikat like moonlight in chandagar thy praise flourisheth like the malati flower like christu and kailas kamagar and kashipur like a mirror in sarangabad like snow in the himalayas like shiv's necklace in halbanir like a swan in hajipur on seeing which the heart is fascinated like white sandal in champawati like the moon in chandrajir like moonlight in chandagar like the ganges on shiv's head like cranes in bulandabad shineth the light of thy praises the persians the english the double-faced men of france the mirdang players of makran sing thy praises the inhabitants of baghkar of kandhar and of gor and the gakars and gurdzis and those who live in on air meditate on thy name in the east in palau in kamrap and kaman wherever man goeth there thou presidest thy glory is perfect written and spoken incantations cannot affect thee o lord and none can find the limit of thy praises god is peerless imperishable his throne is immovable he is peerless endless his praise is unrivalled he is indestructible and the invisible lord he is everywhere king he blossometh in the forest and the glades his splendour is like the spring everywhere diffused the great one pervadeth the woods and glades birds and quadrupeds he everywhere blossometh he is beautiful and wise he blossometh like flowers and glittereth like the peacock cupid on recognising him waveth a chari over him 
his power is perfect he is the bestower of food the merciful the treasury of favour the perfect the bounteous wherever we look there appeareth his splendour he is free from anger and a treasury of favour he everywhere blossometh he is beautiful and wise he is the great king of the woods and glades of sea and land his splendour appeareth everywhere he is the treasury of favour his light dazzleth his glory is perfect the sky and the earth repeat his name over the seven heavens and the seven hells his net of karma is spread unseen End of compositions of guru gobind singh extracts from akal ustad section thirty five of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain compositions of guru gobind singh extracts from vichitar natak one guru gobind singh addresses god as a sword to destroy his enemies i bow with love and devotion to the holy sword assist me that i may complete this work thou art the subduer of countries the destroyer of the armies of the wicked in the battle-field thou greatly adornest the brave thine arm is infrangible thy brightness refulgent thy radiance and splendour dazzle like the sun thou bestowest happiness on the good thou terrifiest the evil thou scatterest sinners i seek thy protection hail hail to the creator of the world the saviour of creation my cherisher hail to thee o sword i bow to him who holdeth the arrow in his hand i bow to the fearless one i bow to the god of gods who is in the present and the future i bow to the scimitar the two-edged sword the falchion and the dagger thou o god hast ever one form thou art ever unchangeable i bow to the holder of the mace who diffused light through the fourteen worlds i bow to the arrow and the musket i bow to the sword spotless fearless and unbreakable i bow to the powerful mace and lance to which nothing is equal i bow to him who holdeth the discus who is not made of the elements and who is terrible i bow to him with the strong teeth i bow to him who is supremely powerful i bow to the arrow and the cannon which destroy the enemy i bow to the sword and the rapier which destroy the evil i bow to all weapons called shastar which may be held i bow to all weapons called astar which may be hurled or discharged thou turnest men like me from blades of grass into mountains then thou there is none other cherisher of the poor o god do thou thyself pardon mine errors there is none who hath erred like me the houses of those who have served thee are all seen filled with wealth in this cow age and at all times there is great confidence in the powerful arm of the sword which in one moment destroyed millions of demons like sumbd and nisumb which in an instant subdued demons such as dumarlakan chand mand and mahik which in a trice repel demons such as chamar ranchichar and rekachichan which careth thy slave since he hath found a good lord like thee which crushed millions like mund madhu kitab mur and og they who never sought shelter in the battlefield and who retreated not even two paces when blows were dealt around them the demons who could not be drowned in the sea and who could not be burnt by fiery arrows on beholding thy flash o sword cast aside shame and fled thou in a moment didst destroy such heroes as rawan maharawan kumbakaran meganand and akampan in waging war with whom even death grew wearied kumb akumb who having conquered the whole world washed their arms in the seven seas they who were invulnerable and huge were all wounded and killed by the sword in the hand of god
if any one flee to save himself from the destroyer say in what direction shall he flee can man run away from god who stoppeth him with a drawn sword thundering and brandishing it no contrivance hath been made by which man may escape from the wound god inflicteth why o fool seekest thou not cheerfully the asylum of him from whom thou canst not escape thou hast millions of times repeated the names of krishan and vishnu and fully meditated on ram chandar and the prophet thou hast repeated brahma's name and established shiv in thy heart but none of them will save thee thou hast performed millions of penances for millions of days but none of them will avail thee a kauri incantations to obtain thy desires will not be worth thee half a paisa none of them will save thee from the stroke of death why performest thou false penance to the gods it will not avail thee a kauri how can they save thee when they cannot protect themselves from the stroke of death they will suspend thee in the fiery pit of terrible wrath as they are suspended themselves think think even to-day in thy heart o fool without the favour of god nothing can avail thee it is not by the practice of perpetual silence nor by the ostensible relinquishment of pride nor by the adoption of a religious dress nor by shaving the head nor by wearing a wooden necklace nor by twisting matted hair round the head that god is found i speak the truth hear it attentively without entering the protection of the compassionate to the poor and loving him can god be found the merciful one is not pleased with circumcision were i to make all the islands my paper and the seven seas my ink were i to cut down all trees and turn them into pens for writing were i to make saraswati dictate for millions of ages were i to write with the hand of ganesh o thou who holdest the destroying sword i could not please thee even a little without offering thee homage to thy greatness is endless and boundless no one hath found its limits thou art god of gods king of kings compassionate to poor and cherisher of the lowly the dumb would recite the six shastars cripples would climb mountains the blind would see and the deaf hear if god would only show favour how can my feeble intellect o god describe thy greatness i cannot utter thy praises do thou correct this work how far can this worm speak it is only thou o god who knowest thine own praises as a son knoweth not the time of his father's birth how can i tell thy secret thy greatness becometh thee it cannot be described by others thou knowest thine own works o god how shall high or low describe thee Shesh nag whom thou didst create with a thousand heads whom two thousand tongues adorn until now is uttering thy boundless names yet even still he cannot find their limit how far can any one describe thy works the intellect is perplexed in trying to understand them thy subtle form cannot be described i shall describe thy great form when i have obtained thy love and service then shall i put aside all other narratives and describe thee i shall now relate my own history and how the sati family originated at first when god extended himself the world was created by him the man who doeth good deeds is called a demigod in the world he who doeth bad deeds in the world is styled a demon Kaul sign was the first king his strength and form were unsurpassed incomparable and unrivalled Kalket was the second king Kur Baras was appointed the third king in the world kaldhaj was the fourth king who graced sovereignty in this line raghu was born from whom the raghu race was descended from them an excellent son aj was born a great charioteer and archer when he assumed the garb of a yogi he bestowed his empire and throne on dasaroth who also became a great archer he felt desire and married three wives his first son was the prince ram the second bharat the third lachman and the fourth shat rugan they ruled for a long time they then died and went to heaven sita's sons lahu and kushu afterwards both became kings and graced kingdoms and thrones 
on their marriage with the daughters of the king of the panjab they performed various sacrifices they built their two cities one kasur the second lahaur lahore both became very famous ceylon and amrawati the city of indar became ashamed on beholding them kushu and lahu reigned for a long time but were at length caught in the noose of death their sons and grandsons also ruled in this world how far shall i tell their history i cannot even recount their names it is related that kalket and kalrai had innumerable sons in their homes kalket possessed peerless strength and expelled kalrai from the city he fled to the sanaut country where he married a king's daughter the son born in his house of that marriage he named sadhi rai the sadhi race began from that time it was made by the supremely pure creator the sons and grandsons who sprang from sadhi rai were all called sadhis in this world they became very distinguished among men and their wealth increased day by day they exercised independent sway and conquered the kings of many countries they enforced religion everywhere caused umbrellas to wave over their heads and on many occasions performed sacrifices at royal coronations afterwards dissension arose among them and no holy man could arrest its progress heroes and invincible warriors went about carapacened took arms and went to fight in the field of battle for wealth and land ancient is the struggle to compass which men willingly die worldly love and pride have extended quarrels lust and wrath have conquered the whole world nobody can compute the time when enmity dissension and pride were diffused in this world their basis is greed by the desire for which every one killeth himself three the saudis returned to the punjab and waged war with the descendants of kushu who had been left behind the descendants of kushu being defeated fled to benares where they became readers of the veds four those of the expelled descendants of kushu who read the veds were called bedis they carefully attended to their religious duties the king of the punjab dispatched them a conciliatory letter to forget the enmity that prevailed among them the raja's messenger arrived in banaras and explained the contents of the missive to all the bedis upon this all the readers of the veds proceeded to the punjab and on their arrival made obeisance to the king he caused them to recite the veds while all his brethren were seated near him in the assembly they recited the sam ved the yajur ved then the rig ved making gesticulations with their hands and finally the athara ved the raja was pleased and gave them all his possessions he elected to live in the forest to remove his great sins on giving them his kingdom he assumed the garb of a ricky the people tried to restrain him but he dismissed all regret and relinquishing wealth and place became absorbed in god's love the Badi chief was pleased on obtaining the kingdom and in the joy of his heart blessed the saadi king saying when i come in the kal age under the name of nanak i will make thee worthy of worship in the world and thou shalt attain the highest dignity thou hast heard the three veds from us on hearing the fourth ved thou gavest thy territory having assumed three births in my fourth i will make thee guru on the one hand the saadi king went to the forest on the other the bedi king was happy in his sovereignty how far shall i amplify this story i very much fear to swell my book five afterwards again quarrels increased among the bedis which no one could adjust it was the will of god that sovereignty should pass from their family only twenty villages remained to the bedis which they began to till a long time passed in that way until the epoch of the birth of nanak arrived nanak rai born in the line of those bedis conferred happiness on all his disciples and assisted them in this world and the next he established religion in the kaul age and showed the way unto all holy men sin never troubleth those who follow in his footsteps god removeth all suffering and sin from those who embrace his religion pain and hunger never annoy them and they never fall into death's noose 
nanak assumed the body of angad and made his religion current in the world afterwards nanak was called amar das as one lamp is lit from another when the time for the fulfilment of the blessing came then ram das sadi became guru amar das gave him the guruship according to the ancient blessing and took the road to paradise himself the holy nanak was revered as angad angad was recognized as amar das and amar das became ram das the pious saw this but not the fools who thought them all distinct but some rare person recognized that they were all one they who understood this obtained perfection without understanding perfection cannot be obtained when ram das was blended with god he gave the guruship to arjan when arjan was going to god's city he appointed har gobind in his place when har gobind was going to god's city he seated har rai in his place har grishan his son afterwards became guru after him came teg bahadur who protected the frontal marks and sacrificial threads of the hindus and displayed great bravery in the cow age when he put an end to his life for the sake of holy men he gave his head but uttered not a groan he suffered martyrdom for the sake of his religion he gave his head but swerved not from his determination god's people would be ashamed to perform the tricks of mountebanks and cheats having broken his pot's herd on the head of the king of dili he departed to paradise none came into the world who performed such deeds as he at his departure there was mourning in this world there was grief through the world but joy in paradise six guru gobind singh now speaks regarding himself i shall now tell my own history how god brought me into the world as i was performing penance on the mountain of hem kunt where the seven peaks are conspicuous the place is called the sapt shring where king pandu practised yag there i performed very great austerities and worshipped great death i performed such penance that i became blended with god my father and mother had also worshipped the unseen one and strove in many ways to unite themselves with him the supreme guru was pleased with their devotion to him when god gave me the order i assumed birth in this kal age i did not desire to come as my attention was fixed on god's feet god remonstrated earnestly with me and sent me into this world with the following orders when i created this world i first made the demons who became enemies and oppressors they became intoxicated with the strength of their arms and ceased to worship me the supreme being i became angry and at once destroyed them in their places i established the gods they also busied themselves with receiving sacrifices in worship and called themselves supreme beings mahadev called himself the imperishable god vishnu too declared himself to be god brahma called himself the supreme brahm and nobody thought me to be god then i made the eight sakis who were appointed to keep watch over creatures they told people to worship them and said there is no god but us they who did not recognize the primal essence worshipped them as god how many worshipped the sun and moon how many made burnt offerings how many worshipped the wind some recognized a stone as god how many bathed in the water according to shastric rites how many recognizing dharmraj as their supreme judge performed religious ceremonies through fear they whom i appointed to watch over creatures on coming into this world call themselves god they altogether forgot my orders and became absorbed each in his own praise when they did not recognize me then i created men they too fell under the influence of pride and made gods out of stones then i created the sids and the sods and they too found not the supreme being whoever was clever in the world established his own sect and no one found the creator enmity contention and pride increased men began to burn trunk and leaves in their own fire and none of them went my way 
they who obtained a little spiritual power struck out their own way none of them recognized the supreme being but became mad boasting of themselves none of them recognized the real essence but each became absorbed in himself then i created the supreme rikis who afterwards made their own simritis current they who were smitten by the simritis abandoned my worship they who attached their hearts to my feet did not walk in the way of the simritis brahma made the four veds and caused all to act according to them but they whose love was attached to my feet renounced the veds they who abandoned the tenets of the veds and of other religious books became devoted to me the supreme god they who follow true religion shall have their sins of various kinds blotted out they who endure bodily suffering and cease not to love me shall all go to paradise and there shall be no difference between me and them they who shrink from suffering and forsaking me adopt the way of the veds and Sumitris, shall fall into the pit of hell and continually suffer transmigration afterwards i created the tatre who also struck out his own path he pared not his finger nails he decorated his head with matted hair and paid no heed to my worship then i created gorak who made great kings his disciples and tearing their ears put rings in them but he thought not of the way of my love then i created ramanand who wore the garb of a bairagi put a wooden necklace on his neck and paid no heed to my worship they who were created by me struck out their several paths i then created muhammad and made him king of arabia he too established a religion of his own cut off the foreskins of all his followers and made every one repeat his name but no one fixed the true name in man's heart all these were wrapped up in themselves and none of them recognized me the supreme being i have cherished thee as my son and created thee to extend my religion go and spread my religion there and restrain the world from senseless acts i stood up clasped my hands bowed my head and replied thy religion shall prevail in the world when thou vouchsafest assistance on this account god sent me then i took birth and came into the world as he spoke to me so i speak unto men i bear no enmity to any one all who call me the supreme being shall fall into the pit of hell recognize me as god's servant only have no doubt whatever of this i am the slave of the supreme being and have come to behold the wonders of the world i tell the world what god told me and will not remain silent through fear of mortals as god spoke to me i speak i pray no regard to any one besides i am satisfied with no religious garb i sow the seed of the invisible i am not a worshipper of stones nor am i satisfied with any religious garb i will sing the name of the infinite and obtain the supreme being i will not wear matted hair on my head nor will i put on earrings i will pay no regard to any one but god what god told me i will do i will repeat the one name which will be everywhere profitable i will not repeat any other name nor establish any other god in my heart i will meditate on the name of the endless one and obtain the supreme light i am imbued with thy name o god i am not intoxicated with any other honour i will meditate on the supreme and thus remove endless sins i am enamoured of thy form no other gift hath charms for me i will repeat thy name and avoid endless sorrow sorrow and sin have not approached those who have meditated on thy name they who meditate on any one else shall die of arguments and contentions the divine guru sent me for religion's sake on this account i have come into the world extend the faith everywhere seize and destroy the evil and the sinful understand this ye holy men in your souls i assume birth for the purpose of spreading the faith saving the saints and extirpating all tyrants all the first incarnations caused men to repeat their names they killed no one who had offended against god and they struck out no path of real religion the gauzes and prophets who existed left the world talking of themselves none of them recognized the great being or knew anything of real religion nothing is to be obtained by putting hopes in others put the hopes of your hearts in the one god alone nothing is obtained by hoping in others put the hopes of your hearts 
in him some millions read the purans together how many silly persons recite the koran but these books shall be of no assistance at last and shall save no one from death's toils why not o brethren repeat the name of him who will aid you at the last moment consider spurious religion as superstition no such things will avail you on this account god created me having communicated to me the secret he sent me into the world i shall proclaim to all men what he told me i will repeat god's name and all my affairs shall prosper i will not close mine eyes or do anything for show they who wear a religious garb are deemed naught by the saints of god understand this all men in your hearts that god is not obtained by hypocrisy they who act for the sake of display shall not obtain salvation in the next world and it is only for life their affairs prosper kings on seeing their acting worship them but god is not to be found by mummery yet every one wandereth about thus searching for him he who keepeth his heart in subjection recognizeth the supreme being they who by wearing a religious garb keep the people of the world in subjection shall at last be cut with the shears of death and take up their abode in hell they who present appearances in the world experience extreme pleasure in fleecing others spurious and not worth a cowry is the religion of those who practise suspension of breath by stopping their noses they who practise spurious religion in the world shall fall into the pit of hell he who can in no way subdue his heart shall not go to heaven by gesticulation what god himself told me i proclaim to the world they who meditate on him shall go to heaven at last god and god's servant are both one deem not that there is any difference between them as waves produced from water are again blended with it god remaineth apart from those who indulge in wrangling and pride he is not found in the veds or the books of the mohammedans know this in your hearts o saints of god they who practise hypocrisy by closing their eyes should be treated as blind men since the road is not seen by closing one's eyes how can such persons my brethren meet the infinite how far could any one amplify this men would grow weary trying to understand it though one had a million tongues even then he would fail to recount god's praises seven my father departed for the east and bathed at various places of pilgrimage when he arrived at the tribeni priyag he passed his days in meritorious works and alms there was i conceived i was born in patna city and afterwards taken to the punjab where nurses of different kinds fondled me and tended my body in every way i received instruction in various forms when i arrived at the age to perform my religious duties my father departed to god's city eight when i obtained sovereignty i promoted religion to the best of my power i hunted various sorts of game in the forest and killed bears nil gows and elks i afterwards left that country and proceeded to the city of paunta i enjoyed myself on the bank of the kalindri jamna and saw amusements of every kind there i selected and killed many lions and slew many nilgaus and bears fatah shah who was the king became angry with me and came to blows with me without cause here follow in the vichitar natak an account of the battle of bangani the dispatch of mian khan and alif khan to jamnu and nadan respectively to collect revenue the victory gained with the guru's assistance by raja bim chand over alif khan the dispatch of general dilawar khan against the hill chiefs and of his son against the guru who was left unmolested owing to the son's flight the dispatch of dilawar khan of hussein khan to reduce the guru to subjection the failure of hussein khan to carry out his orders his attack on the weaker of the hill chiefs the victory of gopal king of gulur and of ram singh king of jaswan over himat one of hussein khan's officers whom they put to death the single-handed combat between raja ram singh and jujjar singh raja of chander in which the latter was slain the dispatch by aurangzeb of his son to the panjab where the masands fearing that he would attack the guru deserted him and fled to the highest mountains 
the dispatch of an officer named mirza beg to support the young prince and the subsequent expedition of an army under four other officers who believing that the masands were men of wealth destroyed their houses and plundered their property all these details have been given at length in the guru's life nine they who turn away from the guru shall have their houses demolished in this world and the next they shall be laughed at here have no dwelling hereafter and be debarred from all hope sorrow and hunger shall ever attach to those who forsake the service of the saint nothing that they do shall succeed in this world and at last they shall fall into the pit of hell they who turn and fly from the guru's feet shall have their faces blackened in this world and the next the successors of both baba nanak and babar were created by god himself recognize the former as a spiritual and the latter as a temporal king babar's successors shall seize and plunder those who deliver not the guru's money they who love the guru's feet shall never see misery wealth and supernatural power shall enter the houses and sin and suffering not touch even their shadows what is a wretched enemy to him whom the friend preserveth an enemy could not even touch his shadow the fool would lose his labour who can meditate anything against those who enter the saint's protection god preserveth them as the tongue is preserved among the teeth he destroyeth their enemies and allayeth their suffering what can a miserable enemy do to him whom the friend preserveth he cannot even touch his shadow the fool shall pass away ten all death saveth all his saints he hath tortured and destroyed all sinners he has shown wonderful things to his saints and saved them from all misery knowing me to be his slave he hath aided me he hath given me his hand and saved me Gyan pra bod neither the veds nor brahma knoweth god's secret neither vyas nor his father parasar nor his son shuk dev nor the sons of brahma nor shiv knoweth god's limit all four sons of brahma know not god's time lakhs of lakshmis lakhs of vishnus and many krishans declare him indescribable thou art incomprehensible o god and fearless thou art most powerful the creator of sea and land thou art the unshaken endless unequalled immeasurable lord pure one i seek thy protection end of compositions of guru gobind singh extracts from vijitar natak section thirty six of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain compositions of guru gobind singh introduction to the hindu incantations here follow in the tenth guru's granth translations and abridgments of tales from the purans on the twenty-four hindu incarnations the following is the guru's introduction to them o god thou art the creator and the destroyer thou killest and puttest the blame on the heads of others thou dwellest apart and none can find thee wherefore thou art called the endless one they who are called the twenty-four incarnations have not found even a trace of thee o god on seeing thy saints distressed thou becomest uneasy wherefore thou art styled the kinsman of the poor at last thou shalt destroy the whole world wherefore the world calleth thee death thou aidest all the saints as occasion requireth wherefore they call thee their helper on beholding the poor thou art compassionate to them so we deem thee the friend of the poor since thou sheddest the juice of favour on the saints the world calleth thee the ocean of favour thou ever removest the troubles of the saints wherefore thou hast obtained the name of the remover of trouble thou hast come to dispel the sorrows of the saints 
wherefore o god thou art called the dispeller of sorrows thou remainest endless thy end cannot be found wherefore thou hast obtained the name of the endless one thou didst appoint the forms of all things in the world wherefore thou art called the creator no one hath ever seen thee anywhere wherefore thou art called the unseen thou wert never born in this world wherefore every one describeth thee as unborn brahma and the rest all grow weary of searching for thine origin vishnu and shiv what are the wretched beings after consideration and deliberation god made the moon and sun wherefore he is known as the creator ever without a garb he remaineth without a garb wherefore the world calleth him the garbless invisible is his form no one knoweth him on this account he is called the unseen his form is incomparable and unequalled he hath no concern with garbs or no garbs he bestoweth on all but beggeth from none wherefore he is recognized as the provider he is not concerned with celestial appearances or omens this fact is known to the whole world he is not appeased by incantations written or spoken or by charms no one hath found him by adopting a garb men are entangled with their own affairs no one knoweth the supreme god some hindus go to places of cremation others mussulmans to cemeteries but god is at neither they who visit either are ruined by worldly love and contention and the lord remaineth separate from them what is a hindu or a mussulman to him from whose heart doubt departeth the mohammedans use tasbis the hindus malas the former read the koran and the latter the purans fools have died over the discussion they were not imbued with god's deep love they who are imbued with love for the one god disregard human opinion and are happy they who recognize the primal being as the one god allow no other belief to enter their hearts they who cherish any other belief shall be debarred from meeting the friend he who knoweth the one supreme being even a little knoweth the real thing all the yogis and sannyasis the multitudes of shaven heads and mussulmans have plundered the world by their garbs the holy men whose support is god's name remain unknown the unholy practise hypocrisy for the sake of their bellies without hypocrisy they can obtain naught the men who meditate on the one being never practise hypocrisy on any one without hypocrisy they would obtain nothing for no one would bow before any of them if no one had a belly who would describe any one as rich or poor they who have concluded that god is one never practise hypocrisy on any one they give their heads but abandon not their determination they regard their bodies as nothing men who split their ears are called yogis with great deceit they betake themselves to the forest they who know not the virtue of the one name belong neither to the forest nor to the household in the beginning god was the father of the whole world from him light first proceeded i have not sufficient ability to tell the tale or to mention the names of the different creatures he created things strong and weak were produced things high and low were shown separately the primal light which is called the one god he at last infused into all his creatures know that the light of the one god is in all the souls which are in this world 
the whole world shall be blended with god who is described as kaurup whatever is visible and perceptible by the senses man considereth maya the one god is contained in all things but he established them all separately and he pervadeth them all unseen he will call them all separately to account they who have considered him as one have obtained the real thing the form of the one god is unequalled he is sometimes poor sometimes a prince or a king he hath given to all men their several entanglements he is separate from them and none of them hath found him he created all things separately and will destroy them all separately god accepteth not censure from any one it is he who casteth censure on others we now give the guru's remarks on the translations and abridgments of the stories of the hindu incarnations ram avatar since i have embraced thy feet i have paid regard to none besides the purans of ram the god of the hindus and the quran of rahim the god of the mussulmans express various opinions but i accept none of them the simritis the shastars and the veds all expound many different doctrines but i accept none of them o holy god by thy favour it is not i who have been speaking all that hath been said hath been said by thee forsaking all other doors i have clung to thine it is to thine honour to protect me whose arm thou hast grasped gobind is thy slave krishan avatar i do not at the outset propitiate ganesh i never meditate on krishan or vishnu i have heard of them but i know them not it is only god's feet i love great death be thou my protector all steel i am thy slave deeming me thine own preserve me think of mine honour whose arm thou hast taken deeming me thine own cherish me single out and destroy mine enemies may both my kitchen and my sword prevail in the world preserve me and let none trample on me be thou ever my cherisher thou art the lord i am thy slave deeming me thine own be gracious unto me perform everything for me thyself thou art the king of kings it is thou alone who cherishest the poor deeming me thy slave bestow thy favour on me i have arrived and am lying weary at thy door thou art my lord i am thy slave deeming me thy slave reach me thy hand and save me destroy all mine enemies they who loved not god while performing great penance who endured self-torment excessively heated their bodies went to banaras and read the veds very many times obtained not the real thing they gave alms so that vishnu might come into their power but they lost all their wealth they who loved god with hearty affection found him what availeth it if a crane sit closing his eyes and displaying a religious garb to the world if man ever go about bathing in water like a fish how shall he obtain possession of god if man croak day and night like a frog and fly like a bird how shall he obtain possession of god siam and all these saints say hath any one without love pleased god of those who through greed of wealth continued to loudly sing and recite god's praises and who danced but gave not their hearts thereto hath any found the way to god's wonderful world they excited laughter in the world and knew not the essence of wisdom even in their dreams 
the poet siam asketh if god hath been obtained by any one without love several meditated in the forest and returned home weary sids in meditation and munis in deep research have sought for god but found him not siam saith all the veds and the mohammedan books and the wisdom of the saints have thus decided hearken o saints the poet speaketh they who search with love obtain god i am the son of a brave man not of a brahman how can i perform austerities how can i turn my attention to thee o lord and forsake domestic affairs now be pleased to grant me the boon i crave with clasped hands that when the end of my life cometh i may die fighting in a mighty battle blessed is his life in this world who repeateth god's name with his mouth and meditateth war in his heart the body is fleeting and shall not abide for ever man embarking in the ship of fame shall cross the ocean of the world make this body a house of resignation light thine understanding as a lamp take the broom of divine knowledge into thy hand and sweep away the filth of timidity parasnath avatar o thoughtless fool why knowest thou not thy maker o man why knowest thou not god o heedless beast bound with worldly love they on whom thou reposest confidence ram krishan and the prophet whose names thou continually utterest on rising where live they now in the world and why singest thou their praises why recognizest thou not him who is now and ever shall be why idly worship stones will they yield thee any return worship him by whose worship thy work shall be accomplished and by taking whose name all thy desires shall be fulfilled o yogi yog consisteth not in matted hair why wear thyself out and kill thyself wandering consider this in thy mind the man who knoweth the supreme divine knowledge shall obtain the great reward he shall then restrain his mind in one place and not run wandering from door to door what availeth it to leave one's home run away and dwell in a forest when one's heart ever remaineth at home such a person is not an udasi boasting of thy religious fervour thou deceivest the world by the exercise of great deception thou thinkest in thy heart that thou hast abandoned worldly love but worldly love hath not abandoned thee o man with the garb religion consisteth not in wearing a garb it consisteth not in wearing matted hair and long nails or in smearing ashes on the body or dyeing thy raiment if man obtain yog by dwelling in the forest the bird ever dwelleth there the elephant ever throweth dust on his head consider this in thy heart frogs and fishes ever bathe at places of pilgrimage the cat the wolf and the crane meditate what know they of religion as thou endurest pain to deceive men do so also for god's sake thus shalt thou know great divine knowledge and quaff the supreme nectar end of compositions of guru gobind singh introduction to the hindu incantations section thirty seven of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain compositions of guru gobind singh 
thirty three soayas quatrains the following thirty three soayas are also read in abchalangar and other places while the sikh baptismal water is being prepared several orthodox sikhs say that these are the sawayas which ought always to be read at the baptism and of this indeed there is internal evidence one he who repeateth night and day the name of him whose enduring light is unquenchable who bestoweth not a thought of, on any but the one god who hath full love and confidence in god who putteth not faith even by mistake in fasting or worshipping cemeteries places of cremation or yogis places of sepulture who only recognizeth the one god and not pilgrimages alms the non-destruction of life hindu penances or austerities and in whose heart the light of the perfect one shineth he is recognized as a pure member of the khalsa two god is true eternal true to his promise he is from the beginning without beginning unfathomable and invincible bounty mercy self-control austerities daily ceremonies continence fasting clemency religious observances are all contained in the name of the immutable one he is from the beginning pure without a beginning infinite endless without enmity without fear he hath form and is without form or outline he groweth not old he is compassionate and merciful to the poor three god is from the beginning without enmity without garb great true refulgent and resplendent he filleth the inmost hearts of all meditation on him the real thing curbeth natural inclinations thou wert in the beginning before the ages before the world o god thou art all-pervading and dwellest in every heart compassionate to the poor merciful mine of mercy from the beginning unborn invincible indestructible for in the beginning indestructible imperishable everlasting o god the veds and the books of the mussulmans have found not thy secret compassionate to the poor merciful ocean of mercy true everlasting diffused in every heart sheshnag indar ganesh and shiv have searched the veds but found not thy depth o foolish man say why hast thou forgotten god who is ever manifest Five god is immovable from the beginning stainless infinite true and everlasting he is adored as primeval unconceived unborn free from old age supremely pure illimitable he is well known as the self-existent renowned in the whole world one yet in different places o base man why recognize not god who is without stain six o creator thou art imperishable from the beginning without blemish without limits true and eternal thou ever providest sustenance for all animals which are in sea and land the veds the purans the koran describe thee in various ways in the rest of the world there is at last naught but thee o divine one thou art sovereign ruler over all seven thou art known as from the beginning unfathomable imperishable indivisible invisible invincible and illimitable thou art in the past the future the present thou art adored in every place demigods demons sheshnag noad and saraswati recognize thee as true and eternal the purans and the koran know not the secrets of the compassionate to the poor the ocean of mercy eight o true and eternal one perpetual is thy dominion it is thou who madest the veds and the koran thou didst appoint demigods demons sheshnag the past and the present from the beginning before the ages the stainless the indestructible thy light is seen though thou art unseen o foolish man who hath come to tell thee of the invisible god nine demigods demons sheshnag serpents famous sids have done great penance 
the veds the purans the koran all have grown weary singing thy praises o god but thou art not known unto them thou knowest all hearts on earth in heaven and in the nether regions and in every direction thy praises fill the earth they entering my heart told me this ten the veds and the books of the mussulmans have not found god's secret all the sids have grown weary contemplating him the simitris shastars ved and purans all describe him in various ways but god who was in the beginning and who had no beginning whose story is unfathomable cannot be known he saved dru prahlad and ajamal the courtesan was saved by repeating god's name that name is my support the object of my thoughts eleven all recognize that god was in the beginning that he had no beginning that he is unfathomable eternal and perfect the gandharbs the yakshas sheshnag the earth-dwelling serpents the firmament and the four quarters of the world know god the visible and invisible worlds the eight directions the demons as well as the demigods all worship god o man of ignorant mind through regard for whom hast thou forgotten the omniscient the self-existent the treasure twelve some fasten an idol firmly to their breasts some say that shiv is god some say that god is in the temple of the hindus others believe that he is in the mosque of the mussulmans some say that ram is god some say krishan some in their hearts accept the incarnations as god but i have forgotten all vain religion and know in my heart that the creator is the only god thirteen ye say that god is unconceived and unborn how could he have been born from the womb of kausalya if he whom we call krishan were god why was he subject to death why should god whom ye describe as holy and without enmity have driven arjan's chariot worship as god him whose secret none hath known or shall know fourteen say if krishan were the ocean of mercy why should the hunter's arrow have struck him if he can save other families why did he destroy his own say why did he who called himself the eternal and the unconceived enter into the womb of devaki why did he who had no father or mother call the sudev his father fifteen why call shiv god and why speak of brahma as god god is not ram chandar krishan or vishnu whom ye suppose to be lords of the world shukdev parasar and vyas erred in abandoning the one god and worshipping many gods all have set up false religions i in every way believe that there is but one god sixteen some worship brahma as god others point to shiv as god some say that vishnu is the lord of the world and that by worshipping him all sins are erased think on this a thousand times old fool at the last hour all thy gods will forsake thee meditate on him in thy heart who was is and ever shall be seventeen he who made millions of indars he who made and destroyed some millions of bawans demons demigods serpents sheshnags birds and beasts innumerable to whom till to-day shiv and brahma are doing penance without finding his limit he whose secrets the veds and the koran have not penetrated is the great being whom the guru hath shown me eighteen o man by attitudes of contemplation matted hair and the overgrown nails of thy hands thou deceivest all people thou goest about with ashes smeared on thy face and cheatest all the demigods and the demons addicted to avarice thou wanderest from house to house the means by which a yog is obtained 
thou hast all forgotten thou hast lost all shame and succeeded in nothing without love god cannot be obtained nineteen o foolish man why play the hypocrite thou losest thine honour by practising hypocrisy o cheat why cheat people this world is lost to thee and so is the next where the compassionate to the poor dwelleth there shalt thou find no place think o oh, think thou thoughtless and grateful the unseen is not found by assuming garbs twenty why worship a stone god is not in a stone worship him as god by the worship of whom all thy sins shall be erased and by uttering whose name thou shalt be freed from all thy mental and bodily entanglements make the meditation of god ever thy rule of action no advantage can be obtained by the practice of false religion twenty one false religion is without fruit by the worship of stones thou hast wasted millions of ages how can perfection be obtained by touching stones nay strength and prosperity thus decrease and the nine treasures are not obtained time passeth away while saying to-day to-day thou shalt not accomplish thine object art thou not ashamed o fool thou hast not worshipped god so thy life hath been passed in vain twenty two if for ages thou do penance to a stone it will never rejoice thee o fool it will never generously lift its arm to requite thee say what confidence can be placed in it when trouble ariseth it will not come to save thee o ignorant and obstinate man be assured that thy false religion and superstition will ruin thee twenty three all are bound in the meshes of death no ram or moslem prophet was able to save himself god having created destroyed and will again create and destroy demons demigods and sheshnags they who were called incarnations in the world at last died before men's eyes in remorse o fickle man why not run to touch the feet of god above twenty four brahma appeared by god's order and taking his staff and water-pot wandered upon earth we know that she was born at the appointed time and visited all countries the world was created and destroyed at the appointed time wherefore let all recognize god renouncing all the subtleties of the veds and the koran i worship god alone the treasury of mercy twenty five o blockhead thy life hath passed in thy present occupations thou hast not thought in thy heart of the merciful god abandoning shame thou hast grown shameless and leaving thy proper work hast done useless work for thyself when thou hadst horses and great royal elephants thou foolishly thoughtest to ride on donkeys thou didst not worship god o fool and so didst shamefully spoil thy good business twenty six thou hast for long read the veds and the books of the mussulmans but not found a secret in them thou hast wandered in various places to worship but the one god thou hast never seated in thy heart thou hast bowed thy head to stones and cemeteries but obtained not o foolish man forsaking the manifest god why art thou entangled in thine obstinacy twenty seven if any one go to a monastery of yogis they will ask him to repeat the name of gorak if any one go to a monastery of sanyasis they will say that only datrate is true and they will give him his name as the spell of initiation if any one go to the mussulmans they will seize and convert him to the faith of muhammad every sect deemeth that the creator is with itself alone but no one can disclose the creator's secrets twenty eight if any one go to the yogis they will tell him to give everything house and property to them if any one haste to the sanyasis they will tell him to part with his house in the name of datatra if any one go to the masands they will tell him to bring all his property at once and give it to them every one saith bring me bring me but nobody will show me god 
twenty nine if any one serve the masands they will say fetch and give us all thine offerings go at once and make a present to us of whatever property is in thy house think on us night and day and mention not others even by mistake if they hear of any one giving they run to him even at night they are not at all pleased at not receiving thirty they put oil into their eyes to make people believe that they are shedding tears if they see any of their own worshippers wealthy they serve up sacred food and feed him with it if they see him without wealth they give him nothing though he beg for it they will not even show him their faces those beasts plunder men and never sing the praises of the supreme being thirty one they close their eyes like cranes and offer the world a spectacle of deceit they go about with their heads bowed down like poachers cats on seeing such attitudes would be ashamed the more they go about clinging to the hope of wealth the more they lose this world and the next thou hast not repeated god's name o fool that why art thou entangled in thy domestic affairs thirty two why impress false religion on the world it will be of no service to it why run about for the sake of wealth thou shalt not be able to fly from death's myrmidons son wife friends disciple companions none of these will bear witness for thee think o oh, think thou thoughtless and great brute thou shalt at the last moment have to depart alone thirty three hear o oh, fool when life leaveth thy body thy wife crying out ghost ghost will flee thee thy son thy wife thy friends and companions will give orders to remove thee quickly when life leaveth thy body all thy mansions storehouses lands and forts will become the property of others think o oh, think thou thoughtless and great brute thou shalt at the last moment have to depart alone end of compositions of guru gobind singh thirty three sawayas quatrains section thirty eight of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain compositions of guru gobind singh hazar shabad o man practise asceticism in this way consider thy house altogether as the forest and remain an anchoret at heart make continence thy matted hair union with god thine ablutions thy daily religious duties the growth of thy nails divine knowledge thy spiritual guide admonish thy heart and apply god's name as ashes to thy body eat little sleep little love mercy and forbearance ever practise mildness and patience and thou shalt be freed from the three qualities attach not to thy heart lust wrath covetousness obstinacy and worldly love thus shalt thou behold the real soul of this world and obtain the supreme being o man practise yog in this way make truth thy horn sincerity thy necklace and apply meditation as ashes to thy body make restraint of thy heart thy lyre and the support of the name thine alms play the primal essence as thy strings and thou shalt hear god's sweet song by the practice of the songs of divine knowledge waves of melody and exquisite pleasure shall be produced the demons and the demigods in their celestial chariots will be astonished and the munis intoxicated with delight admonish thy heart don the garb of self-restraint and utter god's name inaudibly so shall thy body ever remain like gold and death never approach thee o mortal touch the feet of the supreme being why sleepest thou the sleep of worldly love be sometimes wakeful and alert why instruct others o beast since thou hast no knowledge thyself why ever accumulate sin even now lay aside the love of it 
deemed such things simply as errors and love truly religious acts ever lay up the remembrance of god renounce and flee from mortal sin by this means shalt thou not encounter sorrow or sin and escape from death's noose if thou desire ever to have happiness of every kind be absorbed in god's love o god my honour resteth with thee it is thou who art the blue-throated man-lion moving in the water blue-robed wearing a necklace of flowers it is thou who art the primal being supreme god lord pure living on air it is thou who art the lord of lakshmi great light destroyer of the pride of madhu bestower of salvation destroyer of myrrh it is thou who art changeless undecaying sleepless without evil passions preserver from hell ocean of mercy seer of the past present and future effacer of evil acts it is thou who hast the bow in the hand who art patient supporter of the earth changeless wielder of the sword i of feeble intellect have taken the protection of thy feet take my hand and save me o man worship none but god not a thing made by him know that he who was in the beginning unborn invincible and indestructible is god what if vishnu coming into this world killed some of the demons and exercising great deceit induced every one to call him god how can he who himself did not escape from the stroke of the sword of death be deemed god the destroyer the fashioner the omnipotent the eternal hear o oh fool how can he who was drowned in the ocean of the world save thee thou shalt only escape from death's noose when thou seizest the feet of him who existed before the world when the guru left damdama his disciples sent a messenger after him to tell him of their sad plight the following is the complaint as versified by the guru others say that the hymn was addressed to god by the guru himself tell the dear friend the condition of his disciples without thee the wearing of our blankets is a disease to us and dwelling in our houses is as if we dwelt with serpents our water-pots are stakes of torture our cups are daggers thy turning away from us is like what animals endure from butchers our beloved's palate would be pleasant to us living in towns is like living in a furnace god alone is the creator the beginning and the end of all things endless the fashioner and the destroyer to whom blame and praise are the same who hath no enemy no friend what necessity hath he to become the driver of arjan's chariot the bestower of salvation hath no father mother caste son or grandson why should he have come into the world to be called the son of devaki when he who created demigods demons the eight directions and all extension is called by the name of murar what glory is it to him how can god be in human form sids have grown weary sitting in contemplation of him but they have not been able to see him in any way such persons as narad vyas parasar and dru have deeply meditated on him the veds and the purans have grown weary and abandoned their purpose since they could form no conception of him demons demigods fiends sprites describe him as indescribable the faithful consider him as the subtlest of the subtle and again pointed him out as the largest of the large the one god having made the earth the heaven and all the nether regions they call many he who entereth god's asylum shall be saved from death's noose i recognize none but the one god i know god as the destroyer the fashioner the omnipotent and eternal creator what availeth it to men to worship stones in various ways with great love and devotion the hand groweth weary by touching stones and no spiritual power is obtained rice incense lamps are offered to stones but they eat nothing what spiritual power is in them o fool what blessing can they bestow on thee if they had life they might give thee something be assured of this in thought word and deed except in the protection of the one soul god nowhere is salvation without god's name thou canst not be saved how shalt thou flee from him who holdeth the fourteen worlds in his power ram and rahim whose names thou repeatest cannot save thee brahma 
vishnu shiv the sun and moon are all in the power of death the veds the purans the quran all sects in darsheshnag the kings of the munis meditated for many ages on him who is called the indescribable but could form no conception of him why should he whose form and colour are not known be called black when thou shalt seize and cling to god's feet thou shalt be freed from the noose of death End of compositions of guru gobind singh hazar shabad section thirty nine of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain compositions of guru gobind singh chow pai o god give me thy hand and protect me and all my desires shall be fulfilled may my heart be ever attached to thy feet deem me thine own and cherish me destroy all mine enemies o creator may my family and all my servants and disciples live in peace destroy all mine enemies to-day and all my hopes shall be fulfilled may the thirst for repeating thy name abide with me and may i not forsaking thee meditate on any one besides may i obtain from thee whatever boon i crave save my servants and my disciples single out mine enemies and smite them remove from me the fear of the hour of death be thou always on my side o thou with the sword on thy banner protect me preserve me o thou preserver beloved lord protector of the saints friend of the poor destroyer of tyrants thou art lord of the fourteen worlds at the proper time brahma obtained a body at the proper time shiv became incarnate at the proper time vishnu appeared that was all the play of god my obeisance to that god who made shiv a yogi who made brahma the king of the veds and who fashioned all the world know that he is my guru who made the whole world who created demigods demons and yakshas who is the only god incarnate from beginning to end my obeisance to him alone who himself adorneth all his subjects who bestoweth divine attributes and happiness on his servants who destroyeth their enemies in a moment who knoweth what is within every heart and the sufferings of the good and bad he is pleased as he casteth a look of favour on all from the ant to the huge elephant he is grieved when his saints are grieved and happy when his saints are happy he knoweth every one's sufferings and every secret of man's heart when the creator projected himself his creatures assumed endless shapes whenever thou drawest creation within thyself o lord all embodied beings are absorbed in thee all creatures endowed with speech speak of thee according to their understanding thou dwellest apart from everything the wise and the learned know the secret of this o formless one thou art changeless and independent thou art the primal one stainless without beginning self-existent the fool boasteth that he knoweth the secrets of him whose secrets are not known even to the veds the great fool supposeth that god is a stone and knoweth not the difference between them he ever calleth the eternal god shiv and knoweth not the secrets of the formless one men according to their different understandings give different descriptions of thee o god thine extension cannot be conceived nor how thou didst first fashion creation thou hast but one form and that form is incomparable thou art in different places a poor man a lord or a king thou madest life from eggs wombs and perspiration and again thou madest a mine of vegetables 
sometimes thou sittest as a monarch on the lotus flower sometimes as a sheave thou gatherest up creation thou didst display the whole creation as a miracle thou art the primal one from the beginning of time thy form was uncreated o oh god protect me now save those who are my disciples and destroy those who are not the enemies who rise in rebellion and all infidels destroy thou them in the battlefield the enemies of those who sought thy protection o oh god have died in misery thou hast removed all the troubles of those who fall at thy feet death shall never approach those who even once meditate on thee o god they shall be protected at all times and their enemies and their troubles shall instantly vanish thou removest in an instant the sufferings of those whom thou beholdest with a look of favour they possess in their homes all temporal and spiritual blessings and no enemies can touch even their shadows him who even once remembereth thee thou savest from the noose of death he who repeateth thy name shall be free from poverty and the assaults of enemies o thou with the sword on thy banner i seek thy protection give me thine own hand and save me be thou everywhere my helper and save me from the designs of mine enemies after the completion of the morning and evening obligatory divine services and of the uninterrupted reading or chanting of the granth sahib the sikhs repeat a prayer or supplication called ardas which may now suitably end our presentation of the lives and writings of the ten gurus shri ra guru ji ki fata having first remembered the sword meditate on guru nanak then on guru angad armar das and ram das may they assist us remember arjan har gobind and the holy hari rai meditate on the holy hari krishan a sight of whom dispelled all sorrow remember teg bahadur and the nine treasures shall come hastening to your homes ye holy gurus everywhere assist us may the tenth king the holy guru gobind singh everywhere assist us god himself knoweth he himself acteth it is he who adjusteth standing in his presence nanak make supplication sikhs of the true immortal god turn your thoughts to the teachings of the granth sahib and the deeds of the khalsa utter wa guru meditating on the deathless one endowed with all power compassionate and just utter wa guru meditating on the deeds of those who worshipped the name plied the sword ate and distributed their food in companionship and overlooked others faults o khalsa utter wa guru o deathless creator illimitable this creature forgetting thy name is so attached to worldly goods that he hath forgotten the real thing without thy supreme mercy how shall we cross the ocean of the world o great king lust wrath greed worldly love jealousy and other evil passions greatly trouble our minds but on coming towards thee worldly maladies and afflictions are healed and dispelled show us such favour that we may by word and deed be thine and that in all things we may obtain thine assistance and support grant to thy sikhs the gift of sikhism the gift of the guru's instruction the gift of faith the gift of confidence in thee and the gift of reading and understanding the holy granth sahib may the sikh choirs mansions and banners ever abide victory to the faith may the minds of the sikhs be humble but their intellects exalted utter waguru 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 we offer this ardas in thy presence and at thy lotus feet pardon our errors and mistakes may all sikhs who read and hear the guru's hymns be profited through nanak may thy name o god be exalted and all prosper by thy grace shri waguru ji ka khalsa shri waguru ji ki fata end of compositions of guru gobind singh chow pai end of sikh religion volume five 
by max arthur macauliffe